Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Steve Durian from Jefferson County, uh, your vice chair for the TAC, and I will be uh, taking over for uh, Kent Mormon, who's uh, uh, who won't be in the meeting today unless he's arriving late, but uh, we'll see if he shows up. And uh, in the interim, I'll be running this meeting uh, uh, for the moment, at least. So why don't we get started? Um, first, uh, first order of business is public comment. If there's anyone here who would like to comment, uh, please uh, designate so by raising your hand. Do we have anyone who's wishing to make public comment? Mr. Vice Chair, this is uh, Cam Kennedy. Uh, I do not see any hands raised at this time. Very good, then we'll close public comment and we'll move on to the uh, attachment A, which is the October 26, 2020 TAC meeting summary. If there's anyone who would like to uh, make any changes to the, uh, to the meeting summary, please, uh, uh, please uh, raise your hand and we'll call on you to do so. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, I do not see any hands raised at this time. All right, for, so I will call on a motion and a second to uh, to approve the October 26, 2020 TAC meeting summary. Actually, Mr. Vice Chair, we don't need a motion to accept the minutes. We don't need a motion. The meeting uh, we, will just accept, we will accept the meeting summary as they have been uh, published. Moving on to action items. Uh, item number four is the 2020 to 2023 Transportation Improvement Program Amendment, which is attachment B in your agenda packet. Uh, Ty Cottrell is our staff person who will present that topic. How are you there? Uh, it looks like actually Kent Mormon is now available. So I believe we're going to bring him in to, to chair the rest of this meeting. This can't. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, Mr. Chair. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Having some uh, internet issues all day long today. Um, the um, Are we ready for the action items and presentation by Todd is what I heard? Yes, Mr. Chair. We are just starting item number four. Okay. Let's go ahead and Todd then and move forward. Hello? Right. We can Hello? hear you now. Okay, thank you. Sorry, yeah. everyone. I've been having the same internet issues, I think, all day also. Um, all right, so we have the uh, one policy amendment to your consideration this afternoon. Um, it is Central 70, which is sponsored by CDOT. Uh, so for this amendment, there are three components. Um, the first being a change in the prior funding. 
So the state bonds and loans will decrease by approximately $46.7 million to account for transaction and interest cost reduction. Uh, the second comp component is an amendment um, that will add $30.3 million in state faster bridge enterprise funds to FY22. And this is to reflect a pre previous re resolution allocating the construction contingency. Uh, the third component for this amendment will add federal and local funding in both FY21 and 22 to reflect the developer's proposed refinancing of their TIPIA loan. So the developer is refinancing these, uh, the TIPIA loan to increase the eligible costs and lower interest rates. Um, the additional funds will mainly be used for design and construction of the UPRR crossing and the cover. Um, just as a, a note from CDOT that it should be stated uh, that the, the state funding source remains unchanged with the developer's refinance plan. Uh, so that, I'd be happy to take any comments or questions you may have. Uh, otherwise, the proposed motion is to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the proposed amendment to the 20 to 23 tip. Uh, please raise your hand and Cam will unmute you if there's any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not see any hands raised at this time. Uh, I'm Thank sorry. You. Brian Weimer has his hand up. Okay. Brian? Thank you. Um, I move to recommend to the regional trend. Uh, Transportation Committee, the attached um, 2023 Transportation Improvement Program Amendment as presented by Todd. Thank you, Brian. Is there a second if you'll raise your hand and call on you? Mr. Chairman, I see a second hand raised by Art Griffith. Art, please go ahead. Yes, this is Art. It Said I was in um, listen only mood, but I would like to confirm you can hear me and I'm seconding the motion. Thank you. We can hear you and appreciate the second. Uh, Cam, if you'd unmute the members of the TAC and we'll vote on this. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Are they unmuted? Aye. 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 All those opposed, uh, no. All and any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, we're ready for item five, um, the fiscal year 2020 transportation improvement program uh, tip project delay actions. And Todd, I believe you have this one also. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Everyone can hear me, correct? Yes, we yes, can. can Todd. Yes. yes, okay, all right, sorry. Um, all right, the adopted TIP policy outlines the expectations for the initiation of project phases, including how to address delays if and when they happen. These delays, regardless of what the reason is, um, do tie up the limited funds that are available for Dr. Todd to allocate. So at the end of federal fiscal year 20, uh, just happened this last October, Dr. Todd requested CDOT and RTD to review the status of those projects with FY20 funding, in addition to those that were delayed for a first time last year. And after confirmation, uh, Dr. Cog's staff contacted the sponsors with the project phases that were not initiated, initiated and therefore delayed to one, uh, find out the reasons for the delays, and then also to assist them to develop an action plan going forward to initiate that project phase that was delayed. So the attached report summarizes the project phases that were delayed as of September 30th. 
So obviously COVID-19 this year, uh, you know, played a large role in the development of projects, even if a project was not delayed. Um, over the last few months, TIP sponsors were allowed to make a request um, to Dr. Cog's staff to consider the COVID-19 impacts to their project delays, and then also to, to select from three different options. One was to move the delay deadline out, essentially resetting to a future date. So for example, from October 1st, maybe to January 1st. Um, the second option available them was to move funding into a different year. So for example, perhaps move FY20 funding into FY21 and or shift you know, funding from FY20 to 23 out from to uh, 21 to 24, again, depending on their circumstances. Uh, the third option was to apply to CDOT to use toll credits. Uh, the staff recommendations regarding these COVID-19 impacts to the delayed projects are included within the report. Overall, the report states that seven project phases were delayed for a second year, uh, with two projects already having, having initiated their phases. Um, at the last month's board meeting, uh, each project did ask for a variance in the, in the TIP policy to continue. The remaining five projects were granted a 120-day extension. In addition, uh, four of those projects were also requested and were granted some sort of delay extension due to COVID-19. So in addition to these projects that were delayed for a second year, uh, 32 projects are first year delayed in which five have already been initiated, initiated and therefore no longer delayed. A motion to approve staff recommendation this afternoon would allow them to continue. So just wanted to comment on a few observations um, that staff has noticed about these delayed, delays. Uh, the number of the delayed projects is approximately double versus any normal year. Um, though I'll, I, I think it's important to point out that any first year of a four-year TIP cycle does typically have a higher number of delays um, versus any other three years. Uh, and this is mostly due to just getting the IGAs developed and executed and, and projects underway. Um, the second observation would be, you know, COVID-19 has impacted most of these 32 first-year delay projects, uh, some certainly more than others. Uh, approximately half of those delayed projects stated that you know, COVID was the main or sole reason for their delay. And I think it's safe to say that almost all of the TIP, all of the TIP projects were impacted by COVID in some way, even if they were not delayed. Um, concerning IGAs, um, both the development and the execution still seem to be a large impact on the delays. Uh, approximately 40% of the delays were attributed to IGAs. Um, especially, I think, since uh, sponsors have had since the TIP was adopted in August of 2019 to really work with CDOT and or RTD to execute them. Um, from the observations that we're seeing, these delays are coming from both the local sponsors and the CDOT and or RTD side. Uh, and finally, project staffing and the project pre-planning activities um, continue to occupy, you know, the reasons for some of these project delays. Um, though I think, as I stated earlier, most of these were, again, circling back to COVID. Um, so that concludes uh, remarks that I had about the FY20 report. Uh, I'd be happy to take any comments or questions, or certainly we could direct some of those um, comments or questions to the individual sponsors of the delayed projects. Uh, if not, the motion before you is to recommend to the RTC actions proposed by Dr. Cog's staff regarding TIP project delays for fiscal year 2020. Thank you, Todd. Um, if you have a question, please sure to be, be certain. Please raise your hand and uh, Cam will call on you. And if you could also state uh, what organization you're with, uh, that'll help those on the line that aren't as familiar with the TAC members. So um, are there any hands raised, Cam? All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will give it a second. No, at this time, Mr. Chair, I do not see any hands raised. All right. 
if you're on a phone, uh, you can unmute and speak if you would like now. This is Phil Greenwald from. Go ahead, Phil. From Longmont. Phil from Longmont. Yeah, thanks. I would move to recommend okay. the Regional Transportation Committee actions proposed by Dr. S Dr. Cog's staff regarding the TIP project delays for fiscal year 2020. It's been moved by uh, to to approve this. Is there a second? Raise your hand or unmute and speak. Mr. Second. Chair, I see. Yep. Well, thank you. I see a second hand raised by Brian Weimer. Uh, Brian, when you're ready, please go ahead. This is Brian Weimer County. I would second the motion. Thank you, Brian. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Um, is there any further discussion? Please raise your hand. Cam, has there been any hands raised? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I do not see any at this time. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and vote. I'll vote. Please unmute the uh, mute them, and then we'll vote here. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, uh, nay. Any abstentions? The motion is passed unanimously. Thank you. We'll now move on to the next item. And it's an action item. It's on the uh, urban arterial modal uh, safety, or, no, I'm sorry. It's Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, FAST Act 2022 Infrastructure Condition and 2021 Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan. Uh, targets and I think Alvin Bedell Sanchez has that uh, presentation. So, um, Alvin Bedell, when you're ready, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, TAC members. Uh, I'll be presenting on two of our federal performance measure areas that have upcoming deadlines for Dr. Cog. So, uh, from our latest federal legislation, the FAST Act, state DOTs, MPOs, and transit agencies are required to set performance targets for a number of areas. Uh, as you can see, there are five specific areas outlined from the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration. We're going to be touching on one from each. Uh, the first will be our infrastructure condition targets, which were set back in 2018, and new requirements related for Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan targets, or PTASP. As these are the federal measures, uh, the process is pretty well prescribed either from the final rule or subsequent federal guidance on uh, what data we're using, how we're calculating these values, uh, what timeframes we're looking at for them. And in most cases, they're near-term targets that are using the best available data at hand to set realistic and actionable targets. So like I mentioned, the first one we'll touch is the infrastructure condition targets, specifically looking at our pavement condition targets. Now there are four pavement condition targets, the percent of pavements in good and poor condition on both the interstate system and the non-interstate national highway system. Back in 2018, CDOT worked with Dr. Cog to develop the statewide two-year and four-year targets for these measures. Uh, as Dr. Cog is the MPO, we were only required to set the four-year target and we elected to support the state's four-year target. When it comes to calculating whether a segment of payment is good or poor, there are four condition rating areas looked at. And if that segment of pavement has two or more of those rating areas designated as poor, it's considered a poor, a segment in poor condition. There is also a national or a federal minimum level of performance. Uh, a state cannot exceed 5% of its interstate pavements in poor condition without facing uh, loss of flexibility in some of its federal funding. Now, like I mentioned back in 2018, Dr. Cog elected to support the state's targets and at the mid-performance period, which is right now, BDOT had the option of revising those four-year targets. Uh, they have elected to do so and the Transportation Commission uh, took action back in September to adopt the revised four-year targets that you see on your screen on the far right. 
These are also included in the meeting packet and in any future board resolution. As Dr. Cog elected to support the state's targets, we now have the option of either setting our own four-year targets in the middle of the performance period or electing to continue to support the state's targets. Because we are in the middle of the mid-performance period and we will be working with CDOT to set new two-year and four-year targets in 2022 with more data on hand, it is Dr. Cog's staff recommendation that we continue to support the state's four-year targets as you see on your screen. Uh, included in the meeting packet is also a presentation from CDOT that delves into this topic a little more. And we also have a staff member from CDOT on hand if there are any questions related to our pavement condition targets. I'll pause here, Mr. Chair, see if there are any questions. Okay. Are there any questions for Alvin Bedell? If so, please raise your hand and Cam will call on you. I do not see any hands raised at this moment, Mr. Chair. Thank you. At that, at th then I will entertain a uh, motion uh, to uh, approve this. Oh, well, let's do uh, one more Actually, performance area to discuss, Mr. Chair, before we get to our action oh, item. Okay, that sounds great. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the second area are the PTASP targets that uh, come out of a new rule that uh, applies to Dr. Cog and RTD. So the area is the agencies that are impacted are all operators of public transportation systems that are recipients of FTA grant funds, uh, obviously RTD in our region. In addition to setting targets for the performance measures that you see, they are also required to annually develop, adopt, and certify a PTASP document. Uh, their board took action on this earlier in the year as well for the 2021 plan and the 2021 PTASP targets. Similar with the CDOT targets, these are also included in the meeting packet and will be included in a future board resolution. I would note that in addition to setting safety targets for the transportation system, they are also setting targets uh, agency-wide. So you'll see target reductions for employee injuries and on-the-job injuries. There is a RTD presentation in the meeting, meeting packet as well for your information. And we have a staff member on hand from RTD to answer any questions you might have. Similar with the federal highway side of performance measures, uh, MPOs have the option of either supporting the transit agency's targets or setting their own for the region. And as RTD has uh, developed and adopted their own plan and has set targets based on that plan, it's Dr. Cox staff's recommendation that we support these targets versus setting our own. And uh, I'll pause here for questions before we get into the final part of the presentation and the action. Are there any questions regarding this? Please raise your hand. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I see a hand raised from Mr. Art Griffith. Art, if you're ready, please go ahead. Yeah, I actually had a question at the last moment related to the pavement condition. Um, and I was wondering if the trend um, in poor condition is um, escalating due to lack of funding and i don't mean great escalation but it is there is there a slight trend that would indicate lack of funding to keep things more in a higher level and good yeah thank you for the question all right we do have cdot staff on hand if they want to answer that question Thank you, Alvin. This is uh, Darius Pockbuzz, uh, Performance Data Manager with CDOT. Um, to answer your question, we are seeing a slight increase in poor. Um, the reason why the large jump in the target change is because of better data collection between when the targets were originally set and now. So in 2017, which the baseline was set up, uh, the cracking um, uh, distressor, which Alvin talked about earlier, um, uh, had um, was uh, was missing on a couple of different, uh, not a couple, but uh, many different areas, especially on concrete pavement. That was corrected in 2018 after the target was set, and in 2018 and 19, you'll see um, in your packet you can see where it jumped from 0.25 percent for the interstates to around 2.5 percent in 18, and then 2.7 percent in 2019. So that is the main reason behind it. So while it is increasing, 
um, it isn't as dramatic of an increase due to condition deterioration, but better data collection, and that's what caused us to change the the targets on there. But um, overall, we are seeing a slight increase in 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 um, the deterioration and um, the increase in poor, um, but it's not as dramatic as um, as uh, the 17 and 18 year. That is a data correction piece. I hope that answers your question. Sure, and, and I think maybe you guys had some big projects like the I-25 gap and others that maybe improve the overall condition, but thank you. Yeah, and those and some t those projects once they've been completed, if they've been completed real recently, such as in uh, 2019, um, we we may not see the condition, um, the effect on the condition until uh, next year or two years from now. Okay, thank you. Did that uh, any other questions up to this point on the presentation? Please raise your hand. Yes, Mr. Chair, we have a couple more questions. Next, we have Alex Hyde-Wright. Alex, when you're ready, please go ahead. Hi, um, Alex Hyde-Wright, Boulder County. Um, I had a question on kind of the scope of the FAST Act performance measure. So it looks like at this meeting, we're um, being presented information on two of the five. What is the timeline for the other three? Yeah, thanks for the question, Alex. So. Um, the slide you're seeing, just starting from left to right, we expect to be taking our safety targets annually. So each year, y'all, this is the one y'all are probably most familiar with, we take action for safety targets. We're gonna continue that um, with a discussion later with the board this month. Uh, in terms of the PM3 and the transit asset management targets, uh, we don't see action on that again until 2022. Uh, later in the presentation, uh, you'll see a timeline. Everyone can get a high level view of what actions we expect to take moving forward. Perfect, thank you. And you said there was another hand raise, Kim? Yes, Mr. Chair. Next, we have uh, Eugene Howard. Eugene, when you're ready, please state uh, what organization you're a part of and go ahead. I'm with the city and county of Denver, and I just wanted to clarify uh, the pavement condition performance measure slide. Um, since we or staff is recommending or has taken on CDOT's recommendation, is this these numbers reflective of the Dr. Cog area or is this statewide figures? Uh, these are statewide figures. However, in the presentation provided by CDOT in the meeting packet, there is some information specific to the Dr. Cog region for comparison. Thank you. Yeah, and just to clarify that a little bit, this is Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog staff. Um, so Eugene and everyone, when we when we work through these various sets of targets and measures that we need to set, um, again, as Alvin said, CDOT and Dr. Cog have requirements to set these measures. You know, for each of these, a, a conversation that we have at the beginning is how different are we from the rest of the state? And does it make sense to um, support the state, which is what we're doing on this pavement target, or are our circumstances unique that we're we're better served kind of setting our own target. Thank you, Jacob. Did that answer your question? Uh, yes, it did, basically. It sounds like we are more or less in alignment from a regional perspective to the state, and therefore Dr. Cog's staff feels comfortable accepting these numbers. That's what I'm hearing. Yes, for this. For this measure on pavement condition, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Cam, are there any additional hands raised? No, not at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay. Alan Bedell, if you'll continue to move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So like I mentioned, we wanted to provide a overview of the actions that we have taken in the past and that we expect to take moving forward uh, related to our federal performance measures. So uh, you can see we've been taking annual actions on safety targets since the requirements began in 2017. Uh, 2018 was a big year, not just for us, but for most MPOs across the nation as they set their first round of targets related to infrastructure condition, system performance, and transit asset management. Um, we do expect 2020, 2022 to be another big year as we start a new performance period and work with both CDOT and RTD 
to set new targets for that performance period. Um, so with that, our requested motion to the TAC is to move to recommend to the RTC, the CDOT revised 2022 infrastructure condition pavement targets and RTD's 2021 public transportation agency safety plan targets as required by the FAST Act. Thank you. Uh, if someone would like to make that motion, please raise your hand and Cam will call on you. I see a hand raised from David Krutzinger. Uh, David, when you're ready, please go ahead. Um, I so move. Thank you. David Krutzinger. Thank you. And is, if you have a second, please raise your hand and uh, Cam will call on you. Uh, I see a second from Phil Greenwald. Phil, when you're ready, please go ahead. Yeah, Phil Greenwald for the City of Longmont, Boulder County. Uh, second the motion. Thank you, Phil. It's been moved and seconded. Um, Cam will now unmute the members, and uh, if you would, uh, if you're for the motion, please say aye. 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 All opposed. Okay. Any opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? Hearing none, uh, motion passes unanimously. Uh, we'll now move on to the next item, which is an action item on the Urban Arterial Multimodal Safety Improvement Program Safer Main Streets Project Awards. And Ron, I believe you are going to uh, start this, and if I recall right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ron Pepsdorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations at Dr. Cog here. Welcome, everybody. I'm just going to briefly introduce the topic. Um, the program more, um, uh, more often known as Safer Main Streets program under the, the grant name. Um, Dr. Cog staff, CDOT staff, RTD staff uh, have been working over the last several months reviewing uh, applications that came in for this uh, grant program. Uh, the scoring and selection panel has met several times. Uh, we've convened the advisory panel a couple of times and uh, are bringing forward this initial recommendation and uh, for your for the for tax consideration. And with that, I'll hand it off to Paul Jositis to kick things off for CDOT. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, uh, Paul Jositis, Region 1 Director for CDOT. Um, today, I'm gonna update you on the status of the Safer Main Streets program. Um, before I start, I do wanna thank everybody in advance for your participation in the process. It's taken us a long time and an awful lot of work to get to this point. Um, so with that being said, our goal is to get approval today to go forward with the program through the TAC and then on to the RTC and board and get these projects on the street as soon as we possibly can. And that of course will also help stimulate the economy in this uh, COVID time. As you all know, this is an incredibly important program. We've all been talking about Vision Zero we're all vulnerable users at some point, and the number of serious injuries and fatalities are unacceptable and frankly appalling. I believe we need to do more to protect our citizens and encourage people to utilize alternative modes. In short, if we're serious about Vision Zero, we need programs like this, and we need to make sure projects selected move the needle on safety and also better connect our system for all the modes. We're hoping this becomes a recurring program with a more of a statewide focus. And we did learn a lot while going through this process and we wanna include those lessons learned in any future calls. So our process today included going through the selection panel. They spent a lot of time reviewing the 46 applications. And then they went through the advisory panel after which we brought forward to CDOT leadership who felt it was also important to just add some stronger analytic calculations to help justify the projects selected. 
So to that end, we asked our traffic and safety team to drop what they were doing for about five weeks and do a full benefit cost and level of service of safety analysis, which was a huge undertaking, but brought some real numbers to the table. The good news was that in most cases, the benefit cost and the loss calc solidified that we had selected the right projects. Um, the result of which was that in some cases, we did feel there was a need to go back to the applicant to discuss the merits of the project further before making a final selection on those projects. So we ended up selecting about 30 projects totaling about $59 million, which is the list you can see in your packet materials today. For the non-successful projects, and this is a little bit of a change up over what we had a few weeks back, We've decided uh, rather than doing a second call to get to the full $77 million, that we instead decide to meet with those agencies that were unsuccessful and do a deeper dive into those projects to gather more info before making our final selections. We don't have enough funding to select all the projects, but we do want to do that deeper dive uh, rather than having a second call at this point. So if your project was not selected, uh, we're going to be reaching out soon to discuss some ne next steps and then talk to you about uh, your particular project and see if there's more you can bring to the table to help us make a, a good decision. Um, and let's see. I guess with that, I'm going to hand it off to um, Jordan Rudel to discuss the schedule, and then we'll take some questions at the end of the slide presentation. Thank you all. Thanks, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Jordan Rudel. I'm the manager um, in region one for planning and program management. Jan, if you could please go to, um, back to the schedule slide, please. Advance three. Right there, please, thank you. Yeah, it's, um, as, as Paul mentioned, um, you know, I wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, some of the summary here. It's been a, a little while since we we ran the promotion of this um, project call back in July through this committee, and wanted to just talk a little bit more about some of the, the data of where we've been. Um, as Paul mentioned, we had this set up with a selection um, panel and advisory committee. Those two committees have met and provided recommendations to help get us where we where we were today. And um, a lot of back and forth, a lot of collaboration um, to get to this moment in time here. And you know, we are targeting the approval of these 30 projects, which we'll talk about here more in detail, um, through the RTC, which is scheduled for the 15th of this month, and then the Dr. Cog Board, which is the 16th. And CDOT's Transportation Commission will also be meeting on the 16th. Um, however, due to the funds for these programs uh, being approved, we will be bringing the information forward as a briefing and for informational purposes. Next slide, please. Uh, as Paul mentioned, 46 applications for this program. Um, just wanted to highlight, we had approximately $123 million worth of ideas and a proposal for, for work in this grant program. And very exciting, half the proposed work um, that was submitted actually was on state highway systems. And over half of the applications that we received had some sort of um, uh, transit component associated to it or were adjacent to um, transit facilities. So we wanted to show a little bit more of a breakdown here, just in a recap of what everybody looked at as we were digesting the applications and getting to the point of awarding projects. We uh, as we know, the Dr. Cog area extends both into Region 1 and Region 4, so we wanted to highlight a little bit about um, uh, what we saw there. There's about $100 million of applications requested for work in Region 1, uh, $12 million in Region 4. And then here's, here's a little bit of the breakdown here with uh, the amount of funding request related to uh, transit facilities or transit type of improvements, and then state highway systems. And, when you uh, look at the total project um, pro projects, including the match totals, it's a pretty significant uh, grant program that we see here in, um, in this call. Next slide, please. Thank you. Here, just wanted to you know, recap a little bit more, um, almost by jurisdiction, by county, uh, the number of applications that we received. 
and and that we review to let you everybody run through that a little bit more. Um, just just a data summary here. Next slide, please. Um, and here's where we land today. That we're gonna we're gonna spend a little bit more time talking about the the projects that we're proposing to be awarded here. We we had 30 projects really come out. Um, you know, the, the met the criteria well and and predominantly helped us uh, would help us move the needle on safety. Those 30 projects are span spanned across approximately nine jurisdictions, um, leaving about 16 projects at least at this point in time to to not be recommended. Um, and then again here, just wanted to highlight that 83% of those 30 projects we were excited to see include some form of transit or at least are near or adjacent to a transit facility. 65% of those 30 projects um, were also on or along state highways. And looking at the total number um, of the 58, 59 million, um, including match, it gets us to about $83 million in actual project delivery. Next slide, please. Thank you. And with that, um, I'll turn this slide over to Jessica Mecklebust, our Deputy Director of Program Delivery. Hi, just doing a sound check. Can someone confirm you can hear me? Yes, gotcha. yes we can. Thank you. So uh, what you have in front of you and also is presented in your packet, if I know the information on the screen might be a little bit small for those of you um, with small screens like mine at home, but so this table is in your packet, but this is um, the 30, the list of 30 projects that were recommended for the $58.9 million to be moved forward for funding. And there's a lot of different ways we can, you know, look at the data of how, um, the projects were awarded we we decided you know it was kind of just to go with the list we could have broken it out by county or jurisdiction or kind of um, you know area or region but um, this really is kind of a graphical display of those projects that the panel spent a lot of time really digesting and taping it taking a deep dive um, with the safety data and looking at all of the other um, really important criteria that were considered to be recommended for funding so um, what we've got here is a list. This current list is in alphabetical order, and just want to kind of talk about, um, you know, how we how we landed where we are today with what you're seeing in front of you. So, you'll notice that um, the Lakewood project over kind of in the right column is one of our higher funded projects recommended for $10 million. And what what this um, you know project really did it was demonstrating um, a really moving the needle in terms of safety like Paul recommended and really moving the needle in pedestrian and bicycle accommodation um, over the last five years they've had 806 crashes including several fatalities so that's kind of an example of one of the higher spectrum of the projects that were awarded um, some of the other projects were smaller in scale um, the project in Netherland um, you know, had some proven countermeasures that would work uh, to accommodate. There's an affordable housing complex nearby um, that project. And so that was a project that was awarded or recommended for award. Um, as we, as the panelists move through and after, you know, many hours of conversation and many hours of reviewing um, the applications, we really took a deep dive, like Paul said, um, into the safety analysis and then took that back and then balanced that out with all of the other criteria in the application. So for example, Nederland um, you know, had a lower um, a BC um, but ratio, but really showed that it met some of the really the other strong criteria that we were looking for in the grant applications. Um, whereas Lakewood had a really high BC um, and also met some of the other criteria as well. So there were kind of, there's a cross blend of a variety of projects of size and scope. Um, another example of a project where, you know, currently um, there is no really existing data, the BC was zero, but the potential for improvement was really high. Um, in Commerce City, there's um, a Colorado Boulevard bike, bicycle pedestrian path um, that will connect with the new N-Line light rail station um, at 72nd. So the potential for, you know, really moving the needle and safely accommodating um, pedestrians and bicyclists in the future was very high for that project. So 
you know, we really appreciate the patience that everybody had. This took us a little bit longer than we anticipated, but we really um, are proud of the list we came forward with. The panel members, um, including our partnership with Dr. Cog, were worked hard to um, you know, refine the list and, and really bring forward a good solid um, tranche of projects. Um, you'll notice some of the projects, um, I believe maybe there's six that have partial awards. And generally those are half amount. So the request amount um, and the um, amount that's recommended for funding is about half. And um, we've made good efforts and strides to have conversations with those like local agencies that are getting a half or partial award. And really kind of the concept we were looking for there was that, um, you know, project was really strong, but potentially there were some components of the project that just didn't quite meet, um, you know, the, the criteria that we were looking for in this grant program, but still worthy of getting um, recommended for an award. So um, an example of that is the 30th Street um, separated bike lanes in Boulder, where they're getting about a half of an award. And um, if you recall in the applications, we did ask if projects were scalable in size. And that was really helpful for us as panel members to um, be able to kind of take a hard look at, okay, well, you know, we'd like to recommend this project and, oh, they can build half of it, or they're indicating that they could build a portion of it with some of the funding. So. Um, we are working with the individual local agencies on those partial awards. And if you're an agency that we haven't quite connected with, hopefully we have a phone call set up with you in the near future to talk about that partial award. Um, I think that was all I had on this slide. So one of the tools that we used uh, for selecting our projects, the panel spent a lot of time um, you know, really, like I said, organizing the data in different ways and looking at the applications with different lenses. And so this is a Google map. This is a tool we've been using a lot recently. It's really powerful to kind of just show um, context and kind of a spatial analysis of a project. And so what we've got here, the blue lines are all of the high injury network, um, as well as the critical corridors. Um, the red dots or the green lines are those that have been recommended to move ahead. Um, the green ones are recommended to move ahead. And then the red are those that are um, not recommended at this time. So just wanted to show you kind of one of the tools that we used as we went through the process. You do have a link for this um, in your packet. Although I do want to note that that link is not correct. So you're welcome. Um, Jan will go back to the prior Google slide that has the correct link, but you can go into this map yourself and navigate around if, you, if you're curious about, um, you know, how the projects kind of the recommendations are spread across the Dr. Cog region. This is one of those tools that we created, hopefully for our customers to make that data accessible to you. Um, and I'm going to just let Jan kind of go back to the, um, yep, so he's showing an example kind of of the data layers there. So down in the bottom um, left corner in the orange, you can see the correct link for the map. So the one in your TAC packet is dated at this time. Next slide. Great, so what's next? Um, Paul alluded to this a little bit um, in his introduction, um, but right now uh, there's a, next will be the Dr. Cog and the board will meet in December. And then after those meetings, we've got what we're calling um, Project Solicitation 1.5. This is a little bit different than we um, had, I had discussed with a couple of the local agencies last week. So this information is hot off the press, but. Essentially, what we're going to do is we're offering those local agencies that applied for um, projects in the first call that were not selected, um, we're giving them an opportunity to provide an updated application for reconsideration. So if you were, um, you know, you applied for this application and you didn't see your name 
on the table of 30 projects, you're welcome to come forward um, and we'll reach out to you or you can reach out to us and really talk about your application. Take a little bit of a deeper dive into what elements of that application could be enhanced or modified to really make that application meet um, the criteria for safer main streets, those you know that are really moving um, the needle on safety. So um, also, if you're one of the agencies that got a partial funding, this would be an opportunity for you if you wanted to try for the full funding amount, um, you could do that during this project solicitation 1.5. So over the next um, several weeks, we're working hard internally to really determine what this looks like, what are the parameters. We understand there's probably going to be, you know, lots of questions around um, kind of the logistics of this process. And we're happy to answer some of those today. And if we don't know the answers, we're working on that internally. So um, that will kind of be what we're doing with that um, remaining uh, 20 million that was not awarded in this initial um, recommendation. And then we've heard you um, loud and clear, I believe it was also mentioned earlier in the Dr. Cog um, meeting that the IGA process really um, can sometimes be a hiccup for our local agency partners in getting to project delivery. So we're working internally at CDOT um, on some streamlined approaches and, and really looking at how can we make this process run better for everybody, both you know internally for us at CDOT and for all of our local agency partners. So we heard you and we're working for the safer main streets on what that could look like and a process that can really um, streamline the uh, recommendation and awards so you can get going as quickly as possible. And with that, I believe that's all I had. And um, I'm sure there are questions. I've also got, um, you know, Paul Jositis and Jordan Rudel who spoke earlier and Angie Drum on the line for, um, for questions. Are there any questions on the presentation? If so, please uh, raise your hand and Cam will call on you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I see a question from Art Griffith. Art, when you're ready, please go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks for the clarification uh, from the CDOT presenters. And I, I just really want to concur with um, um, with what a lot have said. A lot of effort went into, you know, looking at these projects. And I agree with Paul and others that let's uh, let's get out these projects that. Um, have I been identified? We think it's a great opportunity about the other projects that uh, maybe didn't score as well, giving them another opportunity with the 1.5 plan. So I'm just really encouraged by this approach and uh, wanted to let you know I'd be making a motion to support it. Okay, thank you. Cam, are there any others hands raised? Yes, Mr. Chair. Next, we have Eileen Yazi. Eileen, please go ahead. Hi, um, this is Eileen from City County of Denver. Just want to say thanks, um, kind of to echo what was just said. Just thank you for this opportunity, you know, to hand out for the region and CDOT to hand out $53 million is a huge, um, it's a it's a huge effort and to go through the process. Um, both, you know, from submitting and then again, thank you for all of that extra additional process related with BCAs and things like that. Um, a couple questions I have or kind of uh, notes is I appreciate the comment from CDOT saying that they would be reaching out with us to work on um, some further project refinements. I just kind of wanted to, you know, make sure that this was added to the notes that uh, Denver definitely would like to continue to work with CDOT. Um, and Dr. Cog is necessary related specifically to one of our projects or two that were combined into one. Um, on the project list, there's a West Colfax plus an East Colfax. Um, those were two separate applications and now they are one. So we want to continue to work with CDOT and Dr. Cog to um, relate and kind of connect and make sure we're all on the same page related to scope and the funding that was allocated because they were, I believe that the reduced amount as well. So I want to continue to work on that. Um, and then kind of related to a, more of an administrative, there's two questions related to the administrative process is, the first question is, um, 
uh, to Dr. Cog and to CDOT actually, but I think mainly to Dr. Cog is, will these projects need to be, need to be amended into the TIP? And then two, um, is it possible through um, the timeline that you mentioned through mid-December through the Dr. Cog efforts and CDOT efforts, can we define or identify the type of funding associated with the projects? Um, hi, Aileen, this is Ron. <clears throat> I'll answer the um, tip question. Yes, projects will have to be amended into the tip as anytime we, anytime that we award um, funding to um, projects through, kind of think of this as uh, sort of a set aside program in our tip. So we will we will tip the projects. We'll we'll amend them in the tip. Um, Todd and I are still having some conversations about the process for that. Um, whether we do sort of a programmatic um, tip category um, for these projects and then list list the specific projects in that category, or if we um, put each project individually in the tip. So we've got some conversation we still need to have to to figure that piece out and. Um, I, CDOT can address the second question along with me, but yeah, ultimately, as part of that process, we have to determine the um, the source of the the funds that are used, since there is a mix of funds in this program. And it looks like next we have a question from Phil Greenwald. Phil, when you're ready, please go ahead. Great, thank you. Phil Greenwald from City of Longmont, Boulder County. Um, again, just echoing the great work that was done. We know that uh, a lot of work went into this, and Paul kind of uh, highlighted that at the beginning about uh, you know basically taking a whole group of folks for five weeks and kind of changing their direction for work. My question was, um, so it sounds like I mean we're hearing we're hearing that there might be $70 million available to this program in 2021 as part of a stimulus package. Is that true? And I have a follow-up. Hey, uh, this is Paul Jusaitis. So, um, to, you know, as far as stimulus money, as I understand it, um, as part of the governor's package, budget package, there was some thought about a future uh, budget that would be for this program. Of course, that's all uh, subject to legislative approval and all the different things the legislature does. Um, and I know Herman's on the line. So Herman, if I've said that wrong, maybe you could chime in. Yeah, no, this is Herman, you're right, um, Paul. It has yet to pass, and if it does, it would be more of a statewide program. Um, but yes, there, uh, it would it would follow a similar model of, of what we're experiencing with here. So then, as a follow up, I would just um, was there a consideration given to since we started with 77 million, correct, and now we're at 73 approximately of total requested amounts for the projects that were selected? Would it just make sense to um, you know, cover that fund, since we have the money available, cover those funds for those selected projects so they're fully funded. Um, so you don't have to go through, I guess, that next step, which is, you know, kind of negotiating with all the jurisdictions that only got partial funding. Yeah, so Phil, this is Paul. Um, you know, our, our plan is right now to award the 30 projects that are shown, which is totaling something like $58 million and change. Um, you know, we felt like uh, that's our best list of projects, but what we wanna now do is reach out to anybody who's interested uh, and have that conversation about, you know, what we might have missed in the review of those projects and make sure that we're selecting the best projects that are out of the last 16. We actually don't have enough funding to fund all of those projects. So uh, unfortunately, there's just not enough funding. So it's 58 million right now out of a $77 million program. So you can do the math there, uh, out another 20 million or so that we still need to uh, award and so that's our plan is to go back to you all have that discussion figure out uh, what we might have missed and then uh, try to select the best projects 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see a question. I see a hand raised from Megan Davis. Megan, when you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, this is Megan Davis from the city of Louisville. Um, I guess, you know, my questions are kind of similar to Phil. Um, first, I, I think this is just excellent work and a really exciting program that was deployed so quickly. So just want to thank everybody for all of their work on that and um, for all the great projects that were submitted too. And then the effort to advance as many projects um, as we can um, really quickly. So um, yeah, just kind of building on what Phil said. I mean, I, I think, you know, it would be great to see this this money um, expended through the one, either the 1 1.5 plan. And since we're not really able to see how the projects were ranked, um, or rated against the criteria. We heard some things about what criteria were applied, but not necessarily able to see that specific analysis. It's just kind of hard to know if it's a couple projects that we're talking about that just barely didn't make the cut or kind of what that looks like. Um, but, you know, it, it seems like it would make sense versus doing a separate cycle to look at, um, if those projects that are on that list that you shared with us at the 58 million that weren't fully funded, if they ranked high and they're really good projects, you know, providing some more funding to those, I don't know if there were some that were sort of just below the line, so to speak, and, and maybe going back to those. So um, perhaps that's, you know, what you're planning on doing, but I just wanted to sort of um, just clarify that I think it seems like the right approach to look at both of those opportunities um, before pursuing a separate cycle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, my next hand raised is from uh, Chris Hudson. Chris, when you're ready, please go ahead. Chris, you might be self-muted on your side. I think I'm working now. Uh, two questions, Chris Hudson with the Town of Parker. Uh, first one is um, was asked by the previous person. It'd be good to know what those ratios were, uh, provide that information to see if we're within potentially striking distance of uh, getting a project with this next call. Second, uh, will there be any sort of official notification for the projects that weren't selected uh, other than, than this? I have to go back to elected officials. So with that, uh, that's my questions. Yeah, hi, Chris, this is Paul. Um, yes, our plan is to sit down with um, anybody who wants to talk to us, go through, uh, whatever information you all need to be competitive and hopefully that will result in the best projects being selected so absolutely that's the plan um, we can share up the data that we have with you all it's uh, really really good data um, so we'll do that and then as far as um, you know final selection of projects uh, our plan was to send out letters both successful and unsuccessful um, so uh, hopefully that, that answers your question. I guess my question would be, when would those letters be coming out, Paul? Well, I'm going to defer to the people who got to do the work. Um, Angie or Jessica, you have any thoughts? Or Jordan on when we might be able to get letters like that out? I, I would assume it's um, after uh, 1.5 is performed. Um, I think the initial round of letters for the initial grant applicants would be after the Dr. Cog meetings. We still probably need to feather that out a little bit because we need to understand the type of funding that's left for the 1.5 call. So I would imagine unsuccessful applicant letters as well as um, successful applicant letters would go out. I think we're trying to aiming to send them out before Christmas. I know I have some drafts in my inbox that I need to read through. However, I would say that we're open to questions and feedback on any of your applications any time before that.
And, and Jessica, that's kind of a good point. Um, you don't have to wait until the board meeting to have a conversation with us. If you have questions, um, you know, we're expecting a bunch of people want to talk to us. So let's get them scheduled and we'll start talking to you all. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Cam, are there any other hands raised? Yes, Mr. Chair, it looks like uh, Art Griffith, you've raised your hand again. Uh, Art, please go ahead. Yeah, I think um, Phil brought up a, a good point and then it was followed up by, I'm sorry, it's someone from Louisville. I, I can't remember the names virtually, I can't see them, so it's more difficult here. But, um, you know, I think uh, Jessica clarified um, and would address also Eileen's comment from Denver is that in this 1.5, um, those partially funded projects um, will get a shot to um, see if they can um, get full funding. Did I understand that right, uh, Jessica? Hi, this is Jessica. So yes, as I said, some of that 1.5 information is kind of hot off the press. So we're working out all the logistics um, internally still and these questions are really helpful as we're starting to kind of map that out so yes if you're looking at your project and you were a partial award and you and you think geez we just can't do this project for partial award um, you're absolutely welcome to go after the full funding amount kind of in that 1.5 session and that's where we could sit down together and go through the application maybe drill in on you know a few of the elements that the panel may have had questions on um, that weren't quite clear in in the information that was provided in the application so that would be an opportunity to do that activity so I think that was a long way to say yes art and, and, and I think that's a great plan because I think what Phil was bringing up is you already got a great list of project and, you know, the project like uh, Eileen brought up, East Colfax, West Colfax, I, I don't know where it stops being East or West, but, you know, I could see that as a high need, you know, so those those projects should get the opportunity to get more and I would support that. Thank you, Art. Is there any additional hands up, Cam? Yes, Mr. Chair, it looks like uh, Chris Hudson, your your hand is raised again. Uh, when you're ready, please go ahead. I forgot to put my hand down, sorry. No, no problem. Uh, looks like we have a hand raised from Eileen Yazi. Eileen, when you're ready, please go ahead. Hi, it's Eileen. Um, thanks for uh, letting me ask a couple more questions. So relating to the conversation that's happening right now is, is one of the questions I, I think that could be helpful in maybe providing some information is related to this, the, the BCA, the benefit cost analysis that the CDOT team did and, and or the ranking of the, the kind of, I don't, I don't want to use the word the re-ranking, but the ranking of the projects of how it, it shook out and how some receive partial funding or maybe to understand is there where the other projects are on the list to to kind of get is it possible to share that with um the TAC and and I think specifically if it hopefully the TAC for transparency and, and understanding the process and then you know specifically related to working with individual cities and towns um, on their projects to see if there was something missed or if they could score better. I think that information would be really helpful to understand um, as we move into phase 1.5 or the next phase. Eileen, this is this is Ron, I'll, I'll jump in. I, th I think it's a, it's a fair question. And, um, you know, like like our all of our recent TIP processes, um, the score, the kind of technical score um, isn't the whole story. There's, you know, lots of considerations that go into putting together a funding package, but I think it's fair to request and for uh, the Dr. Cog and CDOT team to share sort of the the numerical score that came out of the, the scoring process, because, you know, a lot of people put a lot of time into both preparing the applications and reviewing the applications and scoring them against the criteria that, um, that was adopted for this um, program. 
as well as the benefit cost analysis that was um, performed by CDOT so that y'all can you can see that information um, particularly for you know projects that you might um, that we might be able to look at more closely and, and refine for sort of this step 1.5 to sort of know um, maybe have a better idea of how far how how close you are to the mark um, for those for those other projects thank you yeah this paul if i could just add to that a little bit um you know obviously the selection of the projects wasn't entirely benefit cost and in fact many of the projects have benefit costs of zero so we didn't want everybody to get um, overly caught up in the data so it's, it's valuable data but if you're doing a benefit cost for a sidewalk that doesn't exist um, the benefit cost right now is zero so we can certainly give you the high benefit cost number we can and you know the low it's zero we can probably give you an average or something like that we can certainly show you how we calculated benefit costs for your project you know whatever whatever kind of analysis and discussion we need to have to help you score better and help you uh, you know hopefully submit a better application so we can you know truly award money to the best projects that's really the goal here so hopefully that helps Thank you. Uh, next, I see a hand raised from Phil Greenwald. Phil, when you're ready, please go ahead. Thanks, Cam. Um, so Phil Greenwald from City of Longmont again. Um, so if we find ourselves lucky enough to be on this list currently, is there is it ever too early to start the IGA process with CDOT? I mean, should we be doing that now or, or wait till our letter comes out if we're lucky enough to get the letter? Yeah, Phil, uh, this is Paul. Um, you know, we could certainly start working on the 30 projects that are on that list. However, um, this process still needs to go through the RTC and the board for final approval. Um, and so it might be premature to do that until we get those approvals. Thank you. Good question, Phil. Thank you. Cam, are there any additional hands raised? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, next, we have a question from Alex Hyde Wright. Alex, when you're ready, please state your organization uh, and go ahead. Uh, this is Alex Hyde Wright with Boulder County. Um, Eileen stole most of my questions, so I'll uh, rephrase it slightly. Um, I just want to reiterate I think it would be helpful in recognizing that the scores don't tell the whole story, but it would be helpful to see um, the scores and how the projects ranked in comparison to each other. And wondering, um, you know, since TAC is taking action on um, on the motion today, that that won't be available for TAC um, when we vote. But can that information be included in the packet when this goes to the RTC and the board, so that they have that information when they're considering um, approval of the Safer Main Streets suite of projects? As far as I'm concerned, it can. Okay, great. Thank you. I think I think that would be beneficial. Kim, are there any and additional next, hands raised? Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, there are. Uh, next, I see a hand raised from Sarah Grant. Uh, Sarah, please state your organization and go ahead. Hi, thanks. This is Sarah Grant from the City and County in Broomfield, and I just wanted to reiterate uh, appreciation for this program between CDOT and Dr. Cog, really aligning our funding with our values here in the Denver Metro. Um, I also appreciate the, the 1.5 process. I think that's a, a good process. My question is around the, the timing of the expenditures of the funding. Um, when we applied, uh, it was noted that we needed to expend the funds by uh, June 1st, 2023, and I am curious if there is going to be any flexibility with that um, as we move forward into these IGAs and knowing how long this process is going to take to actually get these projects up and running. Um, that'd be great to know if that's still a hard date so we can make um, decisions on whether we can move forward with these projects or not. Thank you. Hi, this is Jessica, and I'm looking, so I don't state it wrong. I believe the initial 
um, asked was for the spending to be complete, but we've actually adjusted that to be substantial completion. And I want to make sure I get the year right. So I'm going to ask Jordan, can you please um, state the year of when substantial completion should occur? Sure. It's uh, the same date that was listed in the application of June 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Kim, are there any additional? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. I see a hand raised from Art Griffith. Art, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I would like to make a formal motion to uh, approve the project list uh, recommended for that 58.8 million. Um, that's what I'm raising my hand for to make the motion. Go ahead then, Art. I make a Is motion. I, motion? I, I don't have the wording on the screen because I just see the question sheet. So, but the, the motion as stated in the packet to approve the recommended list of safer Main Street projects. It's been moved. Uh, is there a second? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, I see a hand raised from Brian Weimer. Brian, please go ahead. Brian, you might be self-muted on your end. Brian? Uh, okay, Brian, we'll uh, come back to you. I see a, another hand raised from Phil Greenwald. Phil, can you please go ahead? I would second the motion from Art from Phil Greenwald, City of Longmont. Thank you, Phil. Had a motion in a second. Is there any further discussion? If so, raise your hand. Mr. 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 Chair, this is Ron. Yes. Just um, just want to get on the record. Um, I think you know Jessica. Um, made the point about sort of conversations going on about the process for the sort of 1.5 process just want to make it clear for the record that um, you know Dr. Cog expects to be involved in those conversations that our understanding of this agreement is that there's not any change to the program um, uh, evaluation or selection criteria that's already been approved um, by um, all the partners in this program so just wanted to get that out there and uh, Dr. Cog staff stands ready to help and assist any of the local government um, project sponsors as we continue through the next phase of this process. Thank you, Ron. Any other comments? Please raise your hand. Uh, Mr. Chair, I see a hand has been raised by Eileen Yazi. Eileen, please go ahead. Hi, this is my hopefully my last comment um, related to this item. Um, and if anything, I put this I put this little note in the chat. Um, as this item moves forward um, through the our, uh, through the Dr. Cog and CDOT process, it might be helpful to add, particularly for our, for our elected officials and our directors that sit on the boards, is when the due date, clarify that due date or reinstate it, um, or like, and then also related to the comment about substantial completion, if you could kind of add, not necessarily it needs to be a hard and fast definition, but provide an understanding what that means. Means. Um, I think that would be really helpful as, as this process moves. Thank you. Is that something that can be added as in the write up, Ron, as it moves forward? Can uh, work with CDOT staff to get that in the packet, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other hands raised, Cam? No, Mr. Chair, not at this time. All right. Then at this time, we will uh, take a vote. Um, Cam will once again unmute the TAC members and alternates representing their members only for a verbal vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, signify by saying no. 
and any abstentions? Hearing no uh, no's and no abstentions, the uh, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. At this time, we'll move on to informational briefings, and um, it'll the first briefings on the 2020 Colorado Aviation System Plan, um, known as CASP, and I believe David Dulane with CDOT will be making this presentation. David, when you're ready, go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, as we would say in the aviation world, how about a radio check? Everybody hear me okay? Here you just fine. Great. Thanks. Presentation is up. Is that true? I think it's coming up here. I see a mouse moving around on it. David, we don't see your presentation yet. All right, let me try that again here. It uh, looks like it was showing a blank screen here. Hang on just a second here. I'm going to try out of this here real quick. Hang go. on, just yep. got it there. Yep. Okay. There, let's do that. All right, there we go. That's good. Well, again, I appreciate the opportunity to brief you all very quickly on our uh, Colorado Division of Aeronautics statewide aviation system plan. I know you all spend a great deal of time talking about a variety of surface transportation matters. So hopefully this will be a great uh, little break from uh, some of those things. And uh, we can all learn a little bit about what's going on with uh, aviation here in Colorado. David, so real briefly, if you could maximize yep. the screen. If oh, you could sure. maximize that screen, it's pretty small on, on the there screen you go. right now. How's that? That look better? Thank you. Yes, thank you. You got it. Very good. I appreciate that. So just a quick little background about uh, CDOT's Division of Aeronautics. Um, while we are certainly with under the purview of, of CDOT, we're a pretty unique uh, group in that uh, our division is actually overseen by the seven-member Colorado Aeronautical Board, uh, who, like the Transportation Commission, uh, the members are appointed by the governor as a type one board confirmed by the Senate, and that's the group uh, that really uh, establishes our direction, sets our priorities, and has the authority to invest the discretionary piece of our budget back into the statewide uh, air and space system. Uh, our division is funded exclusively through statewide aviation fuel taxes collected in Colorado. We do not receive uh, any uh, general fund uh, monies, nor do we receive any other funding uh, from CDOT. So again, if uh, you're flying in the state of Colorado and buying fuel, you are helping fund the very system that you use, and it really works out well for us. So there's our, there's our mission and there's our vision. I won't uh, spend a lot of time reading those to you. You can all read that. Uh, yourself. So one of the things that our enabling state statute uh, compels our division to do is to keep uh, active a, a statewide aviation system plan. And we just finished that here in 2020. It culminated about a 20-month uh, effort that started back in uh, late 2017, early 2018. Uh, to really take a completely fresh look at our statewide aviation system plan. Um, historically, we've we've really tried to update those every five years or so. Uh, the previous one was completed in 2011, but unfortunately, as 2016 came around, we just didn't have the financial resources at that time to, to undertake that uh, back then. So uh, we had a little bit of an extra long period between plans, but the good news was for us, it really let us take a brand new, fresh start, ground up look. We really didn't recycle anything from the previous plan uh, and, and really started with one of the goals being to do a much better job of aligning our aviation system planning with that of um, CDOT's other modal transportation planning. And you'll see a lot of, uh, a lot of similarities uh, uh, here with, uh, with the statewide transportation plan as we go through this. So our aeronautical board uh, finalized this and adopted it back in August. So now this is the plan that will help guide our division uh, and our investment in priorities in the aviation system for the next uh, five to 10 years. So as we went to put this plan together, uh, like a lot of planning uh, uh, efforts, we put together a uh, what we call a project advisory committee. And this, um, uh, this group comprised uh, many, many folks around the transportation industry. We had folks from the airport industry, including Denver International Airport, we had representatives from our Colorado Aviation, uh, excuse me, our, our Colorado Aeronautical Board. 
Uh, we had our staff members. And then I think for the first time ever, as we've done our system plans, we actually included uh, some folks from CDOT's um, Division of Transportation Development. So Kathleen Collins was incredibly engaged with our plan, making sure that our aviation pieces is lined uh, as best as they could with um, CDOT surface mobile planning as well. So out of that, out of that group, we really came up with four overarching goals for our state aviation system plan, um, safety and efficiency, access and mobility, uh, economic sustainability, uh, and then system viability. And for those of you that are students of CDOT's um, broader transportation planning, you'll see that three of those align almost exactly with the mobility, safety, and asset management pieces that are in CDOT's transportation plan. So again, we're really trying to make sure that on the aviation side, our airports and the uh, infrastructure that comprises those matches up to help all of these um, uh, goals uh, become achievable in local communities across Colorado. So one of the first things we had to do is we had to take a look at our airport classification system. And uh, just like uh, roadways, there's different levels of service for roads, there's different levels of service for airports. And we have um, uh, airports that range in size from small, virtually unpaved uh, airstrips all the way up to Denver International Airport, which of course is the uh, one of the busiest large hub airports in the country. So in the previous 2011 system plan, we only had three different airport classifications, major, minor, and intermediate. It, it really didn't do a good job of, of clearly articulating the roles that these airports play in our communities across the state. So one of the first things that we did uh, in our plan with a lot of conversation and dialogue with our airport and aviation stakeholders is we expanded uh, our airport classification categories to really give us a better flavor of what airports do for their communities and how they support the larger statewide um, aviation system. Uh, we also align these more with the Federal Aviation Administration's airport classifications, which were updated in 2012. So uh, this allowed us to align our airport classifications with theirs. So again, we have uh, six different categories from commercial service all the way down to GA rural, which are communities that just have basically a simple airstrip, maybe without major infrastructure uh, at their facilities. So this maybe kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of how that breaks down. So our system plan took a look at 66 different public use airports in Colorado, and you can see the breakdown there on how they compare number wise versus what we had in 2011. So again, this really gives us a good idea of how we can plan for each of these different airport sizes going forward, how we invest um, our division's limited resources, uh, and how we can help council and work with the FAA to help them invest their money in these airports as well. Here's just a quick little snapshot of how our, our system looks. We have 66 airports included in the system plan. Uh, 14 of those are commercial service. 52 are strictly general aviation airports. That means they serve everything except for scheduled commercial air service. So when you think of uh, um, aerial aircraft firefighting or air ambulance or flight training or charter operations or uh, small UPS deliveries, those are the kinds of airports that, that support those sorts of aviation activities. Um, of the 66 airports in the plan, 49 of those are in the federal national plan of integrated airport systems. And those airports um, being in the FAA's national airport system are eligible for federal funding. Uh, the remaining uh, airports are not. So that's an important thing for us to note as well, because um, we're very much about supporting all of the airports in the state, not just those in the federal plan. Uh, 53 of those have on-site aviation weather reporting. Very, very important when uh, folks are trying to get in and out of airports when the weather is poor. 57 of those offer fuel. Again, a key part of infrastructure to keep in the aviation system functioning correctly. And a lot of people don't realize this. Uh, very few airports in the state have air traffic control towers. Only nine of our 66 airports have, uh, have air traffic control towers. So just a little tidbit for you on some of the statistics there. So I will not spend uh, a great deal of time going through these details. If you are interested, uh, I have a link at the end to uh, our system plan. Uh, it's got a great uh, executive summary 
Uh, and then of course that's backed up by a very comprehensive um, several hundred page long uh, aviation system plan. But I just wanted to touch real briefly on some of the performance measures and the system indicators that come out of each of these four goals. And for us in the aviation world, uh, a performance measure is some kind of uh, a thing that we can directly influence at the division, whether that's through advocating for a particular policy or through investing, uh, investing our resources. Where a system indicator is, is something that we may not be able to influence directly, um, but somehow also gives us an idea of how individual airports and our whole system are performing um, uh, as a whole. So I'll pick out one example up there of a performance measure, and that's the percentage of the federal airports that meet the current FAA design standards for taxiways. Um, you'll take a look at that and you'll go, wow, only 10% of our airports meet the standard for taxiway design. Um, and that's kind of an interesting one. And the reason for that is that a couple of uh, years ago, the FAA completely rewrote the standards for airport taxiways and taxiways that met standards five years ago don't today. And that's going to be an issue that we and the FAA work uh, to address going forward. So it doesn't necessarily mean that an airport is unsafe. It just doesn't mean that the standards as they have evolved um, are being met by very many of our airports. So that's certainly something that, for example, we as a division uh, will prioritize with our funding as we look at projects going forward, because this is one of the uh, one of the performance measures that that needs some work. A couple of the system indicators, again, a couple of interesting ones. I think given the, the, the things happening statewide with fires last year, it's interesting to note 64% of our 66 airports have the capability to support aerial firefighting. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean just runways. It can also mean the water and the storage capability for retardant and all of the other things that are necessary to support uh, that particular uh, type of aviation activity. If we take a look at uh, access and mobility, you know, one of the uh, broad performance measures that's certainly not unique to Colorado, it's one that really almost every single state in the country has in their system plan for aviation is what percentage of the population is within a 30 minute drive time of an all weather runway. And here in Colorado, we do very, very well. We're at 83%. And a lot of people wonder, well, well, why is that important? And, you know, we always say, uh, you know, if you're in a place like Del Norte or you're in a place like uh, like Rangeley and you have a medical issue and you need to be evacuated in quick order to a larger city like Salt Lake or perhaps Denver, you sure want to have access to an airport where airplanes can get in and out even when the weather is poor. So that's one of the reasons that is one of our uh, biggest performance measures and most important under access and mobility. Economic sustainability is a huge part of our division's um, uh, culture and helping airports make sure that, that they not only serve a valuable transportation service for the rest of the state, but that they're also sustainable both locally and statewide. So of course, one of the things that uh, is very important for airports to stay sustainable is fuel. If you don't offer fuel, uh, you don't necessarily have um, the ability to support airplanes. Uh, you don't have the ability to make revenue. That's one of the largest revenue sources for small uh, airports is the ability to sell fuel. So um, uh, that's one of the big performance measures for us. Um, one of the other system indicators in this is how important do local communities um, or how, how do local communities view the importance of their airport? Do they think that they're important enough that they're recognizing them and including them and addressing them in local and or regional comprehensive plans? And you can see down there only about two thirds of those 66 airports um, uh, can say that. So that's certainly something that um, you know, we would encourage local airports to do with their jurisdictions is make sure that they are being accounted for in their local planning um, as well as in the federal planning. And lastly, it would be system viability. And you know, this is again, kind of falls in line with the asset management piece of CDOT surface transportation. Um, and you, you all talked a little bit more about highway condition. Uh, airports do a very similar thing. And uh, the aviation and airport world uses what's called a pavement condition index or PCI uh, on a scale of 70 to 100 based on uh, the quality of the pavement, how old it is, the condition, 
Um, the challenge that airports have is that airport runways cannot deteriorate to the condition that some highways are often allowed to deteriorate to because of safety. Uh, when you have airplanes landing and taking off from runways, they need to really, really be in a very, very high level of, um, of condition. And that's a challenge for us. It's one of the biggest things that we spend most of our discretionary money in is pavement maintenance. And so uh, right now we look at a percentage of airports with an average runway and taxiway pavement condition of 70 or greater. That's considered to be good or better. Only about half. And we've got a lot of work to do on that. And that's certainly not a challenge that's uh, that's unique to the aviation world. So that's really kind of the four goals that we have. And then the, the last thing that was really sort of wrapped up in the system plan uh, with any system plan is it takes a look at, you know, to close all those gaps, to meet all those goals, what, what kind of money do you need? What sort of investment do you need? And over the next uh, uh, 20 years, uh, excluding Denver International Airport, and a lot of our planning excludes Denver International Airport, certainly not because they're not important, but because as a large hub airport with a lot of complexity, they do all of their own planning. We engage very little with them on that. But if you back out all of the capital work being done at Denver, um, we have about $1.75 billion worth of needs at Colorado's airports over the next 20 years, and the gap is significant. So this is one of the things that, that again, our board works for is to advocate for good federal funding for airports. Um, to advocate for um, ability for airports to use their revenue broadly to do the things they need to do to keep their airport viable and help us meet those goals. Now, the challenge is for us as a division, as I mentioned up front, uh, we're funded exclusively with state aviation fuel tax revenue. And of course, it's no big secret with the onset of the COVID pandemic earlier this year, uh, people haven't been flying so much. You all saw the stories about um, airliners being parked in the desert. There were literally dozens parked at Denver International Airport, and that's reflected uh, in our revenue. Um, we finished the year uh, in, in the end of June with about $26.6 million of total revenue, where we had originally expected to see between 33 and 34. Um, so that certainly has reduced our ability as a division to take care of these things in the system plan, but hopefully that revenue will come back soon and we're already starting to see that. So this is the um, number of gallons of jet fuel sold every month at Denver International Airport. And for our division, this is one of our key, uh, our key performance metrics that we watch. The revenue from Denver International Airport provides about 75% of um, the revenue that accrues to our division. And you can see what happened to revenue in April and the number of gallons of fuel that have been sold. Uh, the lighter blue line up top is 2018 and the dark blue line is 2019, just to give you a, a flavor there. So the good news is we're starting to see that come back, uh, but we are still seeing fuel flowage um, at Denver and most airports statewide at levels between 45 and 50 percent of where they normally would be right now. So unfortunately for us, that meant we had to um, postpone some of our projects that we had planned for 2021. And uh, we're optimistic that hopefully some of this revenue comes back sooner rather than later. So as I start to wrap this up, one of the biggest challenges we had is um, our, our system plan was really ready for adoption um, and it was complete in May, uh, but we really did not want to release uh, that product at that time based on all of the great information that happened pre-COVID. So we took a pause and we added some additional scope of work uh, to our project and we actually did what we call chapter zero. Um, it's really sort of a prequel to the whole system plan and it's a very detailed analysis of the overview of the COVID pandemic, how it impacted um, the aviation industry as a whole, what it's done to Colorado airports in particular. And our team interviewed 19 different airports around uh, the state, including Denver International, uh, to get their flavor about what we ought to be thinking about going forward in the next two or three years as we work to bounce back from the impacts of COVID. So if you're interested, it's a, it's a pretty short read. That chapter is very fascinating. Um, and there's the uh, the link uh, for that. Now on the good news, the other thing that we were able to do with our system plan that we worked on concurrently is we updated our uh, statewide aviation economic impact study. Uh, that had last been updated in 2013, but um, it's a tool that airports and communities and uh, all sorts of folks, uh, including OEdit, like to use to talk about the economic impact of aviation and airports across the state. And for 2020, which was based on 2018-2019 data, 
Um, aviation and airports accounted for over 345,000 jobs, um, $16.2 billion in payroll, um, $27 billion of value added, which is basically a state gross domestic product, and then total business revenues or, or output of almost $49 billion. And you can see that from our last study in 2013, that was on average about a 30% increase um, statewide. Denver International had a significant increase as well, and they once again cemented their place as the largest single economic engine in the entire state, aviation or otherwise. So if you're interested uh, in that, all of that data, as well as individual airport uh, economic impact reports are available on our website at Colorado Aeronautics. Oh, I thought I had it up here. I'm sorry. It's, it's uh, colorado-aeronautics.org. Right up there at the very top is our website. All of this information uh, is up there. So uh, again, we also have a very, very um, a prolific uh, uh, presence on Facebook. Uh, we have a great YouTube channel, so we have a lot of cool things that we do I could talk about for a long time, but um, hopefully this gives you an idea of how we do a little bit of our aviation system planning here in Colorado, and I would really encourage you to take a look at at least the executive summary if you're curious what we're uh, faced with over the next five or ten years. So with that, Jacob, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Are there any questions for David? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I see a hand raised from Eileen Yazzie. Are there any hands raised? Yes, Mr. Chair. I see a hand raised from Eileen Yazzie. Eileen, please go ahead. Sure. This is Eileen from Denver. Um, David, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, really well thought out information and, and just overall just kind of a it's a good departure from uh, just our normal, you know, discussion about this. So yeah, I definitely appreciate this. There was a slide about the fuel usage. I think it might have been missing a key related to what the color, the different color of the line of the colors of the lines meant. Can you either go back to that or? Yes, I'm sorry, Eileen. The legend. No, it's got fine. Omitted. It's just yeah. It was like a dark blue, a light blue, and then kind of an orangish. Yeah, let me uh, let me get back. Let me get back to that here. Yeah, that guy. If you can, there you go. If you can see that. Yeah. So the light blue line is uh, 2018. The dark blue okay. line is 2019. And each of those uh, over on the left, that's uh, millions of gallons of fuel gallons. Uh, dispensed at Denver by month. Okay, and then the the brown yellow line that's our 2020 Ugh, yeah that's the whole okay. 2020 line it's the one that makes me sad <laughs> <laughs> the one that keeps you up at night it that, sure does exactly yeah one of the I, things that's interesting yeah. eileen it's a it's a great point is um and it's interesting is when our when i mentioned that that most of our revenue comes from denver international airport most of our disbursements go right back to denver international airport as well the way our state statute um dictates we use our fuel tax revenue is right off the bat, two thirds of every um, dollar of fuel tax that we collect goes right back to the airport where the fuel tax or the fuel was sold. And the airports can use that revenue um, for just about anything we want. So unfortunately for us, the biggest impact um, because of the reduction in fuel sales across the state has really been on individual airports because the checks that we send them every month have become significantly lower as well. And then the remaining one third that accrues to our division is reduced by the same amount. So I wanna make sure that maybe people understand how our, our money goes back out the door. We don't keep all of that for ourselves. Got it. And David, um, I'm glad the ESP function between you and I is working because that was my next question. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm glad the uh, the uh, the aviation equipment is working well to help communicate. That. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so that's that's really great to know. So essentially, this is very similar. I mean, just kind of like with our gas. I mean, this is essentially what you just mentioned is very similar to like our yep. gas. Tax. It's like kind of exactly what, we, what what's put in is what what gets put back. Um, and you know, down to the state and the jur local jurisdictions, and then even from a you know, if you wanted to go look at it with transit and the fare box recovery and stuff like that. So very similar. Okay, and um, I think that's all I have. Thank you for explaining this chart a bit more. 
No, you bet. And we also have uh, two other charges under state statute. Our division is also tasked with promoting aviation safety. So we have a number of statewide programs that we uh, fund and implement to do that. And we're also tasked with funding aviation education. And that means everything from traditional workforce type development all the way uh, to helping um, elected and uh, other leaders understand the value of aviation. So we have a pretty broad mandate uh, with not a lot of resources to do it, but uh, we do better than most other states. And, I, and if I can also on that note, thank you for you know doing that plug because I will say is your the economic impact analysis that you guys were able to do is so helpful and so critical one to tell our story collectively. I mean for you and then also for Ben in Denver, it's so helpful to have that information because we do use it. Our leadership and elected awesome. officials they do recognize that significantly. And I think um, kind of to maybe tie this a little bit in is also another shout out and thank you to this this committee, the TAC and um, our regional um, board is, you know, again, continue to support Kenya um, just as as it relates to a big economic economic driver for our state. Well, thanks, Eileen. I appreciate that. Thank you, Eileen. Kim, are there any additional hands raised? Yes, Mr. Chair, I see a hand raised from Megan Davis. Megan, when you're ready, please go ahead. Hi, um, thank you. This is this is Megan Davis um, with the City of Lewisville. David, thank you so much. That was a really uh, very informative presentation. Really appreciate that. I have two questions. Um, one of them is related to um, what you have heard or what you kind of uncovered in the process of putting the plan together around community impacts related to airport noise. Um, we in our community, this has been a, a growing concern. We're near RMMA and I know that um, Centennial has an airport noise roundtable and we are soon to have one in our re region um, with regard to kind of the growing impacts associated um, with specifically certain types of aircraft um, single engine aircraft, um, flight schools, that type of thing. So I'm just wondering, you know, if and how that was captured and reflected. I just read the executive summary, not all 700 pages. So <laughs> right. I could be in there. And then my second question is, um, I know the, the, the draft um, Colorado Greenhouse Gas Pollution Roadmap probably came out after you completed this, but, you know, there were recommendations in that around, um, you know, reducing the use of carbon fuels and specifically an aviation component. And I'm just curious how, if that is integrated into the investments that you um, kind of relayed, is our, our um, innovations or technologies in that area included in the kind of gaps in funding and the need for investments? Or is that an area that you think that you may capture when you update this plan? So that's a great question, Megan. Thank you. I'll take the second one first. And the short answer to that is yes, we did touch on uh, the next generation of um, aircraft technology, which for the smaller, uh, at least for now in the next five or 10 years, the, the next generation is going to be focused on small single engine aircraft that have the ability to potentially operate um, on electric power. We talked a little bit about that in our plan. Unfortunately, right now, there are no aircraft certificated for electric use here in the United States. Um, we're still probably at least two or three years out from having that. So um, they, the electric aircraft community has not yet determined things like charging needs or standard plugs or things like that. But I can say that our division and our board indeed are incredibly interested in how we can foster uh, the development of that next generation of, um, of aircraft, which, you know, it's gonna be a long time before we're ever flying on a Southwest 737 size aircraft that's powered by electricity, if ever. Um, but it doesn't mean that some of the smaller single engine airplanes won't be uh, making that transition soon. Um, in fact, it's notable here in Denver by aerospace um, down at Centennial Airport is probably at least 18 months away from um, certifying a two seat electric powered general aviation training aircraft. They have 700 plus orders for that airplane. Um, we're working closely with them to find ways on how our division might be able to help uh, participate, develop uh, with the development of that kind of um, infrastructure. 
And so then the first one with noise, um, Megan, that's another great question. Because our system plan looks broadly at the entire system and does not look very um, detailed at individual environmental issues at every airport because they are so different, the short answer to that is we did not uh, get into individual airport noise issues because they are so unique and specific to a particular airport. And so um, in that regard, uh, our plan really defers to local airport sponsors and the jurisdictions around those airports uh, to focus on those noise issues. Because while some airports have significant um, uh, challenges with that, many airports in the state do not. And so it was difficult for us uh, within the scope and expense of our budget to do a whole lot um, on an individual airport basis with that. Okay, understandable. Thank you. I really appreciate that info. You got it. Thank you, David. Uh, Cam, are there any additional hands raised? No, Mr. Chair, not at this time. Thank you. Again, thank you, David, for that uh, presentation. Appreciate it very much. No, thank you. And I just I would like to point out real quickly that George Holikoff is my uh, alternate uh, on this committee. George is a uh, director of planning at Denver International Airport, and I know he'd be happy to take any questions regarding the planning efforts or anything going on at Denver International. I know he's on this call as well. Okay, thank you. At this time, I think we'll move on on to the next informational briefing and it's CDOT's policy directive uh, 1601 the interchange approval process uh, amendments and uh, Aaron Willis with CDOT will be making the presentation I understand and it is a change from what we've had for the last several years Aaron yeah, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and TAC members. Uh, can can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. All right. So, yeah, I'm uh, Aaron Willis. I'm a transportation planner with uh, with CDOT, and I'm in the uh, the planning branch. And uh, what I have for everyone uh, today is an overview and a discussion on the update to CDOT's uh, interchange approval process. Um, we uh, call this this process uh, the 1601 interchange approval process. And just as a way of background, um, CDOT has a number of different policies and procedures. Uh, this one happens to be numbered uh, 1601. Um, I think internally we sort of use that term and though that um, that number around, um, but but really it, it just uh, doesn't have any um, significance other than um, being the number of uh, the number that was associated with policy and procedural directive. Um, and so uh, let's make sure that everybody can see my screen. Um, let's see this. Um, and how about Aaron? We're seeing your we're seeing your now, um, we're seeing the presentation version of your of your slideshow. The presenter view. Oh, okay. The presenter view. Okay. Let me. Uh, Switch. Uh, thank you, Ron. Let me. Uh, okay. How about how about now, Thank you. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, just uh, by way of, of background, just to um, make sure that everybody uh, sort of gets up to speed on what this policy does. Uh, it is the uh, guiding principles and necessary steps to approve a new interchange uh, or interchange modification on the interstate uh, system, the freeway system, the, the state highway system. 
Um, and uh, as I go through this presentation, I'll talk both about the policy directive, um, which is uh, the overarching policy for interchange approvals. Um, and it's, it ends up being um, about an eight or nine page uh, overview on what the department likes to see in terms of uh, interchange approvals and sort of overarching principles. Um, and then simultaneously, I'll also talk about the procedural directive, and that serves as the step-by-step -step, uh, instructions that are required um, to um, go through all the different approvals and uh, subsequent processes um, for uh, interchange um, um, approval. And so I'll talk about them uh, together and, and interchangeably. Um, and I, th I think I'll make a note when I'm talking about one versus the other. Um, but by way of, of process, our, our Transportation Commission, um, they will be the ones who will approve um, all of our revisions to the policy directive. And then CDOT's uh, executive director will then uh, be the one approving the changes to the procedural directive. Um, and so again, by the way of background, we started um, updating this, this policy, uh, policy or PD um, earlier this year. And, uh, and we started off with what uh, was more of a administrative sort of a cleanup language approach um, to what we were, what we were um, to, to items that needed to be updated um, some of our appendices uh, in this policy needed to be updated uh, some language needed to be um, brought into line with um, some things that had occurred from an FHWA perspective um, and then soon uh, it quickly uh, evolved and to include um, some elements that help to uh, preserve our, our system and uh, and, and with the inclusion of some transportation demand management requirements, um, which I'll spend the, the majority of the, the presentation talking about. So thank you for allowing me to go through that, that bit of background um, as I continue here. Um, again, the, the PD applies uh, both to uh, CDOT uh, and our, our local applicants, um, and applicants um, are responsible for interchange uh, maintenance in perpetuity. Um, and that is uh, um, not a change from, um, from what has been in place in the past. Um, and all of those commitments get uh, identified in a final IGA in the process. So the, the process is overarching. It, um, it does include a, a lot of different subtleties and complexities, um, but uh, it's important from a department standpoint uh, to create a policy that works for everybody um, in the state and, uh, and ensure some level of consistency. Um, if you're looking, if, if you're a local, local app applicant and want to construct an interchange up north or in south or on our mountain corridors, Generally speaking, the process um, should follow the, the same steps. So, um, and so, so again, the purpose of this um, PD uh, policy directive is to preserve the uh, state highway system level of service. It's also, um, it also ensures a fair and consistent consideration of uh, proposals for new and existing interchanges. And also, um, we want to create a process where we've correctly matched the, the level of information that's required based on the sophistication of the application. Um, and then um, the process is overarching and, and it's an, an, an umbrella process um, generally. Uh, because uh, it includes the FHWA processes, it includes MPO or transportation um, planning, um, uh, TPR, transportation planning region um, actions, um, actions that are necessary by the commission, um, actions that are internal to CDOT. So it, it does sort of cover a lot of different um, a lot of different processes and regulatory pieces um, from our federal partners as well. So what the proposal sets forth is 
three types of interchanges and these each one of these interchanges uh, is, is appropriately matched with um, what the what CDOT feels is the correct level of approval. Um, so when we talk about the first type, which is a, a brand new interchange on the interstate or freeway system, those are what we call a type one. Um, those are approved and always get approved um, and go before the, the commission, the transportation commission for action. Um, these, the second um, level is, is what we call a type two. These are new interchanges on the remaining state highway system um, and interchange modifications. Um, and those can be approved by CDOT's chief engineer. Um, and then lastly, very uh, minor modifications on, onto interchanges which don't require a systems level study. Those can be delegated by the chief engineer for um, uh, for approval by the, the regional transportation director. And so broadly speaking, when we talk about the procedural directives, that larger sort of step-by-step -step, um, guide in, in terms of, of, uh, of the entire process, um, that generally follows roughly these, these steps listed here, um, which in, start off with some form of notification, um, a pre-application meeting, um, and often at that pre-application meeting, that determination on what level of type we're talking about for interchange, um, all the different steps um, get discussed um, there as well. And then uh, an intergovernmental agreement, and that agreement is in place primarily to recoup um, CDOT staff times in, in terms of re document review and other um, preliminary tasks that help to usher a project um, through, through, uh, through the process. And then, um, then uh, the, uh, the process moves forward with a systems level study. Um, and so this is the study that looks specifically at the interchange location, um, looks at future and current um, projections, the preferred alternative, safety, um, all of the necessary an, an analysis to, to look at interchange um, functionality. Um, and then the CDOT approval of that systems level study comes next. Uh, and that is an action that is taken by the Transportation Commission. Um, the process also includes the MPO uh, and TPO board actions and consistencies with um, regional transportation plans and tips if, if need be, um, conceptual design and the NEPA process and also baked in is um, actions by FHWA. Um, and then all of the various um, commitments, um, financial outline, um, ongoing maintenance requirements, all of those um, things that have been discussed throughout the process get wrapped up into a final uh, IGA. And once that final IGA is approved, the applicant um, can then receive a uh, um, notice to proceed, a um, access permit, um, and proceed um, through the, the construction process. So again, when I was speaking about um, some of the administrative um, pieces that we were looking to clean up when we looked at, uh, at, at revising the, the PD, um, it really, in, in summary, really covers these first four items. Um, and I'll talk through um, each four and then we can spend um, the majority of the time talking through the new requirement, the transportation demand uh, management requirement. Um, and so when we originally um, were looking at revising um, this uh, policy directive, which we um, really haven't, haven't done so um, um, for, for a number of, of years, um, that we first looked at uh, a requirement that was recently uh, published uh, in 2017 from FHWA um, and that uh, FHWA uh, interchange access request 
uh, that um, technical um, memo that they, that they provided helps to streamline um, the process that um, local applicants um, and the department uh, go through in terms of requesting access to the interstate system um, and really making um, uh, a technical, uh, replacing a, a more technical um, uh, outlining process with a far more streamlined process, um, replacing what is, is commonly referred to um, by, uh, for, uh, from FHWA staff as the eight policy points. Um, and so those eight policy points um, have been replaced with a technical memo um, um, that uh, helps to reduce um, duplication and, and extra um, analysis. So um, the, the uh, staff felt that that was uh, an improvement uh, and um, helped us to sort of replace an entire section in the in the procedural uh, directive and uh, helped to streamline the process overall. Um, secondly, the uh, project milestone um, component was added um, in the draft. Um, that outlines uh, a discussion that needs to take place um, during some of the initial conversations, uh, that pre-application meeting notably, and then getting captured in the IGA. Um, but that just includes a uh, discussion on um, project milestones, what will be accomplished when. Um, and, and really this just adds an, an additional level of, of clarification and proper expectations once um, all of the approvals have been um, provided. Uh, third uh, point, IGA requirements. I think um, in our initial draft, uh, we had um, included IGAs um, for everything, even including um, minor, uh, minor um, interchange improvements, the type two ways. Um, and so we replaced that language with um, making that at the discretion um, are, uh, of the RTD if the RTD sees that that is um, something that's necessary. And then lastly, um, access management clarity. So um, we, the applicant, you know, understands that they need to um, also, they need to um, submit and develop a systems level study. Um, and in our, in the state highway access code, uh, there's provisions there that also require uh, an access management plan um, that is a plan that looks at all of the adjacent areas to the proposed interchange, um, making sure that um, those, uh, the, the potential for backup on uh, adjacent facilities and all of those type of issues get, uh, get looked at and analyzed correctly. Um, and so those first four points, um, staff believes that that just simply makes uh, uh, it simply makes uh, the uh, the overall policy just better uh, uh, and and more clear. Um, and then uh, lastly, the um, transportation uh, demand management requirements. So I'll get to that now. So first of all, before I, I really delve into this, um, just why why would the department be looking at um, adding a TDM requirement to our interchange approval process? Well, a lot of uh, really good reasons and a lot of good um, uh, planning and best practices um, is, is, the, is the short answer. Um, so we understand that local applicants um, put forth a lot of, uh, a tremendous amount of investment. Um, when the department builds um, interchanges, there's a tremendous amount, tremendous amount of investment there. Um, and and what can this policy do to help to preserve that, um, that uh, those dollars um, and, and ultimately become good stewards of those dollars. Um, one of those strategies is uh, TDM and using TDM transportation demand management strategies um, to help uh, preserve uh, that large uh, that large investment. Um, and, and often um, the TDM strategies can often do make way for future um, uh, investment um, and then uh, cause. Uh, help to promote uh, the early promotion of multimodal options. 
Um, and then lastly, um, greenhouse gas uh, reduction benefits can be sought through a lot of uh, TDM strategies. So um, what we're proposing here is a, uh, a TDM requirement included in this uh, interchange approval process and uh, with the intent and purpose of preserving, again, the overall functionality and operability of the state highway system. Uh, and then uh, what we've put forth is the development of a TDM scorecard that would be used to hit um, target goals and develop a TDM project specific plan that would be included in the systems level study. Um, and this requirement would apply to uh, type one, those new interchanges on the interstate system, um, type two, new interchanges on the um, remaining state highway system, uh, and then um, type 2A modifications on uh, the interstate system. Um, and it would not be uh, apply, it would not apply to the minor um, type 2A interchange, um, interchange modifications. Uh, and then those TDM uh, commitments would then be captured uh, in the final IGA. And so the department is really looking at um, developing and we've developed a, a, a list of strategies um, that um, if implemented uh, with a particular um, interchange project um, could result in a 3% or greater um, ADT reduction in, MP, in NPO areas or 1% greater uh, ADT reduction outside of uh, MPO areas. And so that's that's the overall goal um, we're, we're looking to achieve um, with this with the list of strategies um, and the inclusion of this in our in our process. Um, we'd be looking at measuring those traffic volumes at the uh, for, for new interchange uh, ramps as identified in the systems level study. And then uh, also the inclusion of uh, uh, looking at if those TDM strategies were implemented or in a phased approach, um, seeking that, that same measurement over a five-year period. And so um, we did include um, situations and instances where um, maybe TDM uh, might not have the greatest impact or maybe not be um, appropriate. So we've included um, um, some ex some uh, an exemption um, language uh, in, 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 in the draft. And so that uh, those exemptions would take place uh, and those exemptions would either take the form of uh, you know removing or, or uh, waiving the TDM requirement or reducing the TDM requirement. If um, the interchange is being constructed um, with the primary intent and purpose of serving a freight or intermodal facility, um, the second um, uh, the second piece is if there's sufficient TDM already in place um, to address future demand, um, and then. In instances where it's um, a very rural context where the improvement is being um, made for safety or resilience uh, purposes and, and where TDM would be of a limited effectiveness. So what we've then created is the scoring range uh, uh, based on the location of the uh, interchange and the type and the interchange type. Um, and so um, you take a look at this, uh, you'll just notice that um, the highest scoring range or the largest um, amount of, of TDM um, projects or, or strategies we'd, we'd like to see implemented um, applies to new interchanges on the interstate system um, in MPO boundary areas. And things get um, progressively um, uh, less from from that point. And so, again, we've got um, a number of TDM strategies that um, we've developed. And what CDOT did is in 2019 redeveloped uh, a statewide TDM 
um, plan. And so that statewide TDM plan looked at um, gaps. Uh, it looked at a number of TDM strategies statewide, um, what works best in certain areas within different um, community contexts. And then uh, that plan also did uh, cost benefit analysis for the range of possible TDM strategies. And so they looked at, based on the dollars spent, what provides the greatest uh, VMT reduction. Um, and so what uh, staff did is really take that hard work uh, and, and just directly uh, insert it into, um, into this um, draft policy. Um, and so this is really just a, a sample, um, but uh, just provides you, and, and this is just broken out into um, an 80 point section, which includes our mobility hubs, shuttles, feeders, vanful programs, um, mixed use, transit oriented development, um, community, uh, telecommu telecommuting program. MC Transit comprehensive ITS uh, solutions. Uh, and then we have a 60 point um, section and a 50 point section, um, a lot of different types of, of uh, strategies we've included, um, ranging from programmatic to um, construction type um, projects to transit service and parking management. Um, and then we have uh, 50 point section, a 40 point section that include um, connected vehicle readiness, ITS, further ITS uh, programs, bike and pedestrian facilities, regional ride share. Um, and the and in sum, the applicant then looks at that, that scoring range that they're trying to achieve. Um, they look at the strategies that um, that are developed and then they take all of that information and then they put forth a good faith effort in developing uh, a project specific TDM plan that includes and outlines the, the explanation of an explanation of the strategies, uh, how those strategies will function within the context of the new interchange uh, implementation ske uh, schedule, uh, making sure that what they're um, proposing doesn't detract or serve as a replacement from uh, existing uh, TDM strategies. Um, they'll also perform an analysis um, uh, on how the proposed TDM strategies will achieve the goal. And that could either be done modeling or um, through a reasonable estimate developed by a traffic engineer. Uh, this estimated cost, marketing, promotion, uh, and then discussions on um, if, if it's appropriate um, for uh, TDM to take place during construction. Um, and then lastly, um, we were also included a provision that looks at an evaluation of the TDM strategy um, after one year after um, opening day for the new facility. Um, and so I have uh, had the great opportunity to talk to us. I see a lot of the names um, on the list of, of, of folks in this, um, in this meeting. I've had a great opportunity to talk with um, several counties, uh, several cities uh, listed here, uh, and sort of get the the feedback from a lot of folks. And uh, you know, again, uh, a, this is one of those policies that um, has to be written in a way that fits not only uh, metropolitan areas inside the MPO, but also um, our rural uh, areas and our other smaller MPOs throughout the state. Um, and, uh, and in all those um, conversations, I've heard a lot of really good uh, uh, comments, uh, and um, which uh, has uh, ha has the department um, looking at how we might uh, do some some further work, some further refinement um, on, on on this policy on what we're proposing here um, to make sure it's as uh, you know inclusive and covers um, all areas of the state um, as best as best possible. Um, so just to give just a brief uh, summary on some of the continued um, work that we need to do um, in terms of making sure that this this policy and this um, this TDM component fits every part of the state. Um, 
these four bullet points sort of capture uh, some of the just just some of the, the comments and some the, some of the continued uh, discussion that staff uh, is can, is working on to sort of respond to. Um, one is um, a lot of discussion on um, adjacent or parallel facilities and whether um, that uh, three percent. If we could look at that three percent um, reduction, um, perhaps at a larger scale and not necessarily at the specific interchange and this was um and, I, and this is a, a question that comes up from uh, some of our um, planning partners um, from up up, uh, up north um, i-25 um, where the densities um, the population densities don't quite um, uh, match up um, where there's still need and there's still um, you know, strong justification to, to build uh, an interchange. Um, some of the populations, uh, thresholds and employment um, things that really make um, TDM work well aren't quite there. So um, their, their thought is, um, you know, is it, can we look at things at a corridor level um, in some way and, and factor in improvements on parallel or adjacent facilities? Um, so again, Staff is, you know, sort of giving that some thought and sort of working through and chewing, chewing on those concepts um, uh, as we as we move forward. Um, other um, really good um, point that ca that came up in, in in conversation was oftentimes when you build a new interchange, you might not want a lot of pedestrian traffic on it. You might not want um, uh, bikes on it um, and, and perhaps the, the better strategy is to have those bikes on an adjacent facility or maybe there's some improvements that can be uh, made to a, a, a nearby bike path or something like that. So how does, how would cr credit work in, in that capacity? And so again, that's another issue that um, staff is sort of chewing on it and, and making sure that that um, can fit within um, within the context of uh, this this um, pro this proposal. Um, uh, uh, the other point is there are um, still you know rural areas that are within MPO boundaries um, and and areas that aren't anticipated to to have a lot of uh, growth or reach sort of urban level growth. Um, for some time, and so um, what kind of strategies should we, we look at there, and and what should we consider to make sure that this would um, this would fit those areas too? And again, that's something that um, we're we're doing some doing some more work on. Um, and then lastly, uh, the duration, and uh, we have uh, just started the process of, of sort of really fine tuning. The strategies that I've shown um, before, in terms of making sure that each one of those strategies has uh, an, an appropriate time duration attached to it, um, especially um, some more of the programmatic level um, pieces, uh, making sure that there's time duration there too. Not only so that there's you know clear expectations on how long that particular you know program will be in place, um, but to make sure that. You know the the applicant uh you know is is uh you know achieving doing their best or putting forth that good faith effort um to achieve that three percent of that one percent goal um and so um just in terms of next steps um again um cdot is uh glad a lot uh, a bit of uh, internal work to do um and i i, I uh, uh working to schedule some internal working sessions um, with staff uh, to uh, make sure that we address um, these comments and there's some other comments here not um, not listed and just to make sure that the policy this it, it really is all uh, all inclusive and, and so it covers every uh, situation um, and so our our thought is that um, we've we provided a, a brief um, to our transportation commission for their December um, for their December workshop, um, that memo is uh, is, in, is perhaps included in the transportation commission um, 
materials. Um, it outlines um, all of the um, all of the, the points we're still working through. Uh, and then um, uh, our, our uh, timeline is to uh, bring some uh, re re uh, bring some resolve to some of these outstanding issues um, over the course of this month. Uh, in time to have a just a, a discussion, a, a workshop um, with the transportation commission in January, um, and then I anticipate um, being able to have uh, possibly some more one-on-one um, uh, -on -one conversations with our planning partners in the in the late January, February timeframe. Um, and I think um, the the direction from our uh, executive director and our deputy uh, executive director is to um, continue to move things forward, but to definitely um, make sure we get it we get it right. Um, and so um, I know uh, there's uh, several people on the call that I've uh, are waiting to uh, receive a uh, an updated draft. Um, and so uh, I do anticipate having an up updated draft uh, later later this month after we've worked through some of these uh, some of these issues. Um, and I do uh, really appreciate your patience um, with some of those some of the folks that I've, I've already had conversations with. And um, really thank you for um, um, the, the contributions and the comments that have been provided thus far. Um, so um, with that, I will. Um, uh, take any any questions. Cam, do we have any questions for Aaron? Yes, Mr. Chair, I see a hand raised from Eileen Yazi. Eileen, please go ahead. Sure. This is Eileen Yazi for City County of Denver. Thank you so much, Aaron, for this presentation. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I have a few questions. So one um, of in the beginning when you were discussing the the process um when it comes to kind of uh that the internal cdat process is you know you're notified of the interchange proposal they need to go through a study effort mm -hmm. then and then there's an iga sign and then and then it kind of and then it comes to the mpo at one point one of my questions um is that i i actually feel like i'm, I'm wondering if it if it is is at all possible to, to move that integration or at least that coordination um, to the MPO earlier. And I think this relates to kind of that regional, local, and transit perspective. While CDOT um, has their has their perspective and, and their needs without a question from an engineering standpoint, I'm just thinking, you know, like for instance, the work that we've been doing here at the TAC um, is we've been we we've recently approved or recommended sorry re recommended you know the the list of projects for the RTP and there's a lot of transit and there's you know a lot of this and a lot of that and so it's just kind of can you know could we could, could this if, if there's a new interchange being proposed at you know in say in Dr Cog region I think it would be really great to get that input from the TAC committee members particularly as it relates to transit and, and kind of again to what you're talking about with the strategy, like is there something already out there that's being done? Um, and then two is related to a lot of the um, BRT and uh, transit multimodal hubs, they're being proposed mm -hmm. on CDOT um, streets. So I think it, it, is that at all possible to, to move kind of a coordination process into that process in the, or a little earlier? Yeah, I, I totally. I think the department um, totally agrees with it, with that um, assessment, right? Um, and I think um, what we've what we've done and what I have in the the written draft is is really just uh, one is an acknowledgement that with this new TDM requirement, there are going to be a lot more people attending and sh and that should be invited and actively participating in step one that pre-application meeting um, and in the uh, in the actual write-up of included you know language um, to the effect that is 
you know, in implementing this TDM strategy, you know, there's going, you're going to, you know, the applicant would need to consider, um, you know, inviting local transit and in, inviting a transportation um, management organization slash association. Um, there's a lot of other folks that perhaps need to be involved uh, throughout the, the, the process. Um, so yeah, we can absolutely um, look again and sort of review it from, from, from that perspective. Um, but I, I think um, I, I think it's um, it's um, maybe uh, a, as much a sequencing issue as it is uh, uh, opening up the, the process a bit more um, and uh, and to, to make sure that um, the the our, our transit partners our our TMA and TMO partners are a bit a bit more actively um, involved throughout. Thank you. Um, and then one of the other, uh, a couple other questions related is if there's a, I know a few local agencies, particularly in, in the Dr. Cog region, that um, that have a TDM program or policy. Mm -hmm. um, Denver's um, working on, hopefully we're, we're hoping to go to ordinance and request ordinance requests through city council in the new year. Mm -hmm. How would how would that kind of connecting in, I'm just trying to think out loud is if there's an integration point of what the local agency, you know, if there is one kind of related to then your policy. I, I don't know the answer. I don't know if we need to figure mm -hmm. out just kind of maybe just a, another, I don't want to add another thing to, you know, to your to-do mm -hmm. list, to the, to the thought process, but just, yeah. I know that local agencies that have approved TDM programs and policies. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point too. Um, I, um, hmm, that is a, that's a that's a good point. Something to definitely think about. Um, and again, yeah, thinking out loud. Uh, I'm, I'm, and Aaron, I can always follow up with you afterward too to kind of talk a bit more further about this. That would be great. Yeah, let's do that. All right. Thank you. Um, Cam, are there any other hands raised? Yes, Mr. Chair. I see a hand raised from Alex Hyde Wright. Alex, please go ahead. Right, this is Alex Hyde Wright with Boulder County. Um, Aaron, I just want to say thank you for the great presentation. This is super helpful and super informative. Um, in particular, I wanted to highlight the TDM requirement. Um, we think that is a fantastic idea to include an extremely timely. Um, given CDOT and the Energy Office's progress mm -hmm. on the greenhouse gas reduction roadmap. Um, I have a couple, one high level questions and then a couple detailed questions um, about the TDM requirement. I guess a, a high level philosophical requirement is that if the TDM is only required when interchanges are built, how, how can we position this to also be able to do TDM perhaps even in place of the interchanges and head off the need mm -hmm. to increase capacity in the first place? And recognizing mm -hmm. that you know the interchange funding is what brings the funding to the TDM to the table, but mm -hmm. wondering how how we can help TDM get ahead of the interchange. You know, if there could be a requirement to do to try or to test TDM in advance to see if it's possible to do enough trip reduction to reduce the need for interchanges in the first place. So I guess first question is is CDOT considering that or thinking about that quandary? Yeah, well, that's that's a very good one. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I um, that is a that's a very good um, question, Alex. Uh, I, I say yes, absolutely. See that is is looking at that and thinking about that, and um, I know that there are folks um, in our Office of Advanced Mobility who are gearing up for uh, the phase two to the statewide um, TDM plan. Um, and uh, I know, um, yeah, that, that I, I don't. I don't have a, a really. Um, I have a long answer in terms of yes, we're thinking about it in various different ways. Um, but uh, um, I think uh, from uh, uh, this particular process. Uh, I recognize it's it's not a question that lends itself to a short, easy answer. Um, so to put that out know, there, it's, it's um, sort of the department. 
Yeah. <laughs> sure yes. Hey, Aaron and yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something we're, we're, we're thinking about. Let me let me. Thank you. Uh, this is Mr. Rock, Chair, go is, ahead. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. I'll, I'll bail Aaron out a little bit here too because um, ultimately, Alex, um, that really is part <laughs> of the regional planning process. So, you know, we look at those things as we're doing our long range transportation plan for the region. Uh, we evaluate the need for those types of additions to the regional transportation system within that context. And then as we're doing refinement planning and, and so forth, we continue to look at those. So I, I do view that not just as a responsibility for CDOT, but part of the regional transportation planning process. Okay, understood. Um, a couple other questions for Aaron or uh, suggestions. One, the 3% trip reduction um, for new interchanges within an MPO boundary, I guess given the um, the forthcoming transportation goals in the greenhouse gas reduction roadmap, which are going to establish, I, I believe, a 96% 96, 96 reduction in emissions by 2050, um, I'm wondering if that three percent is a little low, and if we should be shooting for something higher, like five or ten percent. I guess it it seems like the roadmap is going to outline a pretty ambitious and transformational um, future for transportation. Mm -hmm. And wondering if the if the trip reduction percentages as proposed shouldn't be higher. Yeah, good point. Um, yeah, and we can absolutely go back and, and look at it, look at that, and make sure we're uh, in in lockstep as 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 much as possible with the um, with the uh, greenhouse gas roadmap. Um, it's a very good comment, fair comment. Our thought from a staff perspective was um, an achievable um, goal, um, and, and you're exactly right. Alex, I would agree with that there's some pretty aggressive goals in the in the roadmap and and perhaps uh it, it might be worth taking a, a another look at our goals to make sure that they are in lockstep as as much as possible fair fair comment well, we appreciate any further consideration of those trip reduction goals um one other question um one of the um, possible paths for an interchange to get an exemption um, going through the chief engineer that you listed was that if it's in an area with sufficient TDM to handle future demand. And I guess that one in particular seemed a little contradictory to me um, mm -hmm. because if the if the interchange, if the proposed interchange is in an area that the future, the existing TDM can handle future TDM needs, it kind of, to me, it begs the question of why the new or expanded interchange is necessary in the first place. Um, that if the if the TDM was sufficient to handle it, then the if then the TDM should be able to handle whatever new volumes the interchange would be needing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I I found that path for getting a TDM exemption to be a little concerning. Um, that it seems to acknowledge there will be increase in car volumes, but any increase in multimodal volumes, um, there wouldn't need to be any further TDM component. Um, and I guess one other request is. Is it possible to have the exemption path um, for the TDM requirements kind of at the same level as um, the interchange approval process as a whole? So for the the level one or the category one where those go to TC, um, should the exemption process also go to the TC? And for the level, I think, two or 2A where those go um, to the RTD, um, mm -hmm. would the exemptions go through the RTD? So just wondering if those should align um, the approval and the exemption process. That's a really good point. Um, yeah, let me let me take a look at that. That that from just how you stated it, that makes a lot of sense. Um, not only should the commission see um, the uh, see the systems level study and take action on the systems level study for a type one, they probably um, might need to think about uh, taking action or on an uh, uh, on an exemption or a uh, reduction that's um let me give that some thought thank you that's that's very good thank you and then awesome. um one last question on the um the points that you could get for the different tdm measures mm -hmm. um i guess my initial reaction is that the points seem a bit high for what um an, a local agency or a project would need to deliver and 
some there's you know there's a, a pretty lengthy list of um, different TDM measures that get you 80 points, and for the interchanges I think that are on the interstate system within an MPO boundary that are in the 80 to 100 point range, that right. one of those measures would get you your entire TDM package. And so mm -hmm. I guess to be to be more impactful, it seems like the TDM points proposed could even be cut in half, and then projects would have to do more of the TDM components um, to meet that point scale. So just, I guess the overall concern is that we don't want to let interchanges off too easy and make it make the TDM um, really meaningful and impactful, um, and thus dilute some of the point value so that you have to do essentially more TDM um, to satisfy the TDM requirements. That's a good point, and I think that also goes to your um, your, your three percent um, comment as well. Uh, so let, let, let's take back to token group and um, and give that some more thought. That's those are great comments. Alex, this is Ron. Maybe for the benefit for some people that might be shy or some people that have signed off, um, can you speak to how those values were developed? Because I mean, I always get concerned when um, there's something that sounds like I don't think I don't mean that Alex means it this way, but it sounds like a little arbitrary sort of, well, just cut them in half. It might be better for folks to understand sort of how those values were developed in the first yeah. place. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, um, Ron. Um, and I, I think to, to Alex's point, you know, he's, I think the, the, the overall, um, tone and correct me if I'm wrong uh, Alex is, is just um, making sure that it's uh, trying to get the the maximum amount of uh, of TDM that can help to preserve the the overall um, the overall investment that's made from a new interchange and and how, how much um, TDM can we can we get in, in in a in a project if um, and I, th I think it can help me if I'm um, mischaracterizing your your overall tone um, and I think um, but from a and from a, a department standpoint we relied heavily on that that statewide uh, TDM plan when the when uh, identifying and, and and matching scores um, with the, with the various strategies um, and so we relied on that cost benefit analysis, um, looking at which per dollar, what strategies create the, 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 the biggest, you know, quote unquote, bang, bang for the buck. Um, and so, uh, you know, from a staff perspective, it just made a lot of, a lot of sense that those, um, those strategies are, create the highest probability uh, of an applicant being able to achieve that 3% or that 1% um, overall reduction that we were looking at. So that, those are, that's the foundational piece that, um, that, that, we're, that we're talking about and that, that we use for the development of those various strategies. So yeah, if we were to go back and, and sort of adjust, um, you know, that, that, that would be something um, to, to cut in half, I don't I don't know if you really if we're really in in, in line with um, the matching um, the the appropriateness with the cost benefit analysis that was performed. Um, but I, th I think I, I hear your your overall um, t t tone, uh, and I think um, we can go back and sort of relook at and double check um, our work with with that sort of lens um, in mind. I, I appreciate it. You characterized my, my um, the theme of my concerns perfectly. That the, the basic question is how to get as much um, how to get as much and as meaningful TDM as possible. And I did not have any other questions, but thank you for um, all the answers and clarification and the future consideration on these. And again, thanks for the presentation. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Cam, are there any additional hands raised? It looks like we have, yes, Mr. Chair, it looks like we have a question from Art Griffith. Art, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I was wondering in um, 
collaborating with CDOT and the TAC, would it make sense to do kind of a working meeting with the next phase of the 1601 review process and, you know, um, people that wanted to or spend, have, spend a little more time on the 1601 processes or see them coming up? Um, maybe there could be a kind of collaborative working meeting where some of these ideas mm -hmm. that bounced around and some of them that haven't been um, able to, it's kind of getting late in the day. And um, um, I, I was wondering if that's something we could consider. That's maybe a question to Ron and uh, um, throw that out there. Um, and, you know, I did have need some clarification, like on some of the slides on the, you know, the points and everything. I think we could clear that up a little bit. Like I kind of wrote down several minutes ago, a slide 14 about so many points for bike pad and I was like well to me that seems like that makes sense that it's on a parallel system I I don't know we're really promoting bike and pads to walk on the ramp and go down the interstate and use that along with cars at 80 miles an hour plus or whatever so I think there's some clarification that makes sense to me um and then maybe that would um kind of re result in a better understanding of if the points are too high or too low, but but right now I, there's not enough out there for me to, you know, to even consider that. I don't understand, and I and I think you brought up a lot of those Aaron questions that other people have raised, and really like to consider. I guess my takeaway is this collaborative working meeting with CDOT mm -hmm. and PAC members, maybe even a few consultants, you know, that mm -hmm. that end up doing these 1601s. Yeah. Thanks. I, I'm and uh, yeah, Art. I'm, I'm totally open to that. If that's um, something that uh, maybe um, Ron, if you wanted to see what what makes sense for what the consensus was from the the TAC, but um, yeah, staff is um, very amenable to that. Yeah, I think um, at the pleasure of TAC, uh, we can we can accommodate that request. Art, I'd suggest is probably a special sort of. Uh, Come as you can. Um, right. sort of attack working meeting, not not during attack meeting. If I understood no, your suggestion, no, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. But we certainly can can try to pull that together. It'll depend on a bit the timing that um, Aaron and the CDOT team have for this moving forward. But yeah, I'm sure we could come up with something that will work, and we'll just I, um, get a notice out, and anyone that can make it can make it. Yep. And, and then it would appear that. Um, the meeting coming up in December with TC is is just a kind of an update, Aaron, of where things are at. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And um, and that's that is really uh, I just provided a memo um, mm -hmm. to uh, to um, commission members, um, and then we'll actually have a, a workshop. Um, in in January, that's the plan. Um, but um, I think they, uh, the the timing for sort of a, a, a working session with um, the Dr. Cog TAC, uh, maybe it's um, in, the January. Yeah, that's what uh, I was thinking. Uh, yeah, that would be something in okay. January before you have to go again to whatever next step at CDOT is. Great, sounds, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Cam, are there any other questions or hands raised? Yes, Mr. Ch yes, Mr. Chair. The next one is from Brian Weimer. Brian, uh, please go ahead. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, on slide 11, where you show um, rural and MPO boundary areas and kind of the points between those, I see that there could be some overlap and um, where rural area is actually within the MPO area. And so I'm curious how that would be looked at um, in terms of uh, uh, what category it would fall under. And that's for both type one and type two. Yes, so, um, yeah, yeah, the thought, um, yeah, so uh, so for type one rural areas, 
the range is 80 to 60. Um, and then for type uh, type uh, two type two interchanges in rural. range is 60 to 40. Um, and so really, um, the, the, and, and uh, yeah, you know, what, what, what's, the, what's appropriate for uh, things that are in rural areas with, um, you know, lower population densities versus um, those areas with perhaps higher population densities and employment centers. Um, and so, uh, is this your question that they there needs to be a bit more separation or or what was your what no, was I think your the question is on? if you have a rural area within an MPO mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. criteria is going to uh, apply and I think maybe there needs to be some clarification around how that's interpreted when you have a mixture of both, where it's clearly a rural area, oh, but it's right. also within the MPO boundary. I'm with you. Yes. Yeah. And that, that does go to some of the additional work that um, we need to do in terms of um, yeah, the, the, taking into account um, rural areas um that are still within mpo boundaries um so yeah i, I would um uh, I, I would categorize um your your, your comment in, in terms of uh, uh the additional work that we need to do to, to make sure that um th this this overall um proposal works for um those rural areas that are still within mpo mpo boundaries okay thank you Thank you, Brian. Um, Kim, any additional yes. hands? Go ahead. Yes, Mr. Chair. Next, we have a question from uh, Art Griffith. Art, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I think I piggybacking on to Brian's, but giving it a different spin. Sometimes um, what would appear to be in an, a rural area, we're looking out to 2040 or 2050, could become more urbanized. And so, you know, um, that's part of one of the things I wanted to look into in this working collaborative meeting. And does it make sense to look at things on opening day now with regard to what does TDM meet now as opposed to what it needs to meet in 2040 or 2050? Because that could be two different things especially I think some of the issues that the North brought up that Aaron, you shared in your presentation could apply to the Southern limits of Castle Rock and things like that. So right. um, maybe some thought needs to go into there. Thank you. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And the next question we have is from Lisa Nguyen. Lisa, when you're ready, please go ahead. Thanks. Hi, Erin. It's Lisa Wynn from Den Airport. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I think one thing for us at the airport is um, we are looking at Pena Boulevard improvements and more times than not, because the airport doesn't have its own specific um, design standards for Pena, we've kind of leaned on CDOT more often than not. Um, so kind of looking forward to um, utilize some of these TDM strategies and possibly maybe um, borrowing and implementing some at the DEN level as well for Pena. So um, mm -hmm. just wanted to throw a quick comment and um, a friendly remark. I'll probably be contacting you separately offline too. Thanks. Sounds great. Thank you, Lisa. And that is all the questions I see at this time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you, Aaron, for the discussion and the briefing. Um, before we move on to informational items, uh, I did want to recognize, and I noticed he's already off, that Hank, um, it was his last meeting. Uh, he is retiring at the end of December. And I think, Jacob, you had a few things you wanted to convey.
Okay, thank you. Can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Yes, I can now. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I did want to recognize Hank Proxma. He um, still is, for the rest of this month, our um, non-RTD uh, transit uh, representative on uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, he's been on our TAC for many years. Uh, many of you already know Hank, but for those of you that don't, um, really one of the, um, you know, one of the um, uh, luminaries in, in transportation planning in the Denver region for a very long time um, through his work for the Seniors Resource, uh, Seniors Resource Council, um, and then more recently with Via Mobility Services. Um, Hank really has been a leader, um, both transit generally, but particularly in human service transportation um, and all the work that he's done there. Um, he's also a founding board member of Dr. Mack and Carol Buchanan of Dr. Mack, who's also on the TAC. She had to uh, jump off uh, this meeting as well. Uh, kind of just a couple of quick things I wanted to read really quick. Um, that Hank is a longtime leader of coordination of transportation services in the Denver Metro. He was one of the founders of Dr. Mack. Um, you know, I mentioned his work at Seniors Resource Center, managing transportation services for older adults in the region. Um, you know, he really, he really um, managed and coordinated a lot of that work. Um, he, Hank and his crew also provided the flex ride services in Evergreen and started the Prospector deviated fixed route service in Clear Creek County, uh, which is now known as Clear Creek Transit Solutions. Um, so Hank has, you know, clearly done a lot more than that, uh, but wanted to give you all a flavor of just how much Hank has contributed to this, to this region. Um, he's retiring at the end of this month and we'll miss him very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jacob. Um, for the informational items are there for your review. Uh, we don't need to review them, I don't believe. And um, the uh, then Jacob, if you want to give a quick update on the AMP working group. Hey, Mr. Chair, this is Emily. I'll I'll give yeah, a quick thanks, update. Emily. Person had to log off. Um, but the working group and the executive committees both met last week. The working group uh, reviewed data and data sharing at each of the agencies as it currently exists at Dr. Craig, CDOT, RTD, um, and we also had a briefing from OIT. Uh, at the executive committee, we had two new members, Kay Kelly representing CDOT and Deborah Johnson, the CEO general manager of RTD joined us. There will be a future item at a TAC meeting so we can get a little bit more into details about some of the annual um, accomplishments of the AMP and the AMP working group. So we look forward to that. Thank you, Emily. Um, our next meeting is January 25th, 2021. Are there any other member comments? If so, raise your hand. Cam, are there any hands raised? No, Mr. Chair, not at this time. Okay. Well, I hope I wish everybody um, happy holidays and uh, we do not have a December, uh, another December meeting. Our next meeting will be January 25th. And with that, we're, we'll see you or hopefully see you soon and definitely hear you uh, in January. With that, we are adjourned at 4.30. Thank you.